Astonishing Legends would like to thank Squarespace, Mint Mobile, Wondrium, Stitch Fix, Simply Safe, Stamps.com, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. As I've said on the show before, some of the most fascinating things we've learned over the past seven plus years have been as much about the people involved in the legends as the legends themselves. We alluded to this in the cold open of our last episode, but in our cursory research on that episode on the Enfield Monster, we stumbled across something that surprised us even more than the monster itself. It turns out there was a scientific study conducted in the wake of what happened in Enfield that turned the investigation from the beast to the people that reported and experienced it. When we look at how these folks behave, especially sociologically, we begin to see way beyond the encounters that are the seeds of these stories. We begin to understand how, as the stories grow and expand into folklore status, what part of them we may be able to attribute to that sociology, and what part of them may have had roots in reality. This isn't about the binary decision of throwing the paranormal baby out with the bathwater, as I sometimes say. It's about fully understanding the difference between the origins of actual unexplainable events and the possibly divergent origins of the ensuing stories that can later surround them. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. Orson Welles from the War of the Worlds radio drama. Join us tonight as we talk about what it wasn't. And we're back. Was that Orson Welles? No, because it was too short to be anybody, which was <laughs> yeah, my plan. Really no, I can't. Yeah. No, I got to work on it. He'd be great to do because I remember growing up with him. I remember, uh, no wine is drank before it's time. He did. He was the spokesman for a bunch of wine, which I'm sure he got for free. Well, we are back, folks, and it's good to be back. We've been quite busy lately, so a couple of very quick updates. Firstly, we want to thank Sugarbot Sweet Shop for getting the prize of special sweets together for the winner of Astonishing Madness. They are dear friends of the show over there, and you can order sweets from them online. So get over to SugarbotSweetShop.com and check it out, or if you just want to cut straight to the chase and order something, go to GetSugarbot.com. They're also on Facebook and Instagram at Sugarbot Sweet Shop, so check them out now. We promise you're not going to regret it. Absolutely. Some of the best baked goods I've ever had, no lie. And also, if you want to check out our sister show, The Midnight Library, now is a great time to do that. It's very different from Astonishing Legends, but a lot of fun and filled with the most macabre, esoteric information. And on top of that, it's just past 2 million listens. The host, Miranda Merrick, has just started a new season, so look for and follow or subscribe to the Midnight Library wherever you get your podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode of the Midnight Library. And for those of you who miss us during the dark weeks, we're always lurking about. Most recently, we were on an episode of our friend John Killian's show, XV Planus, discussing, that's right, the Sally House. Drink. Yeah. John just came back from an investigation there and had quite an experience. Yeah. Uh, we were on the finale of a multi-part series he did on it, so look for X, that's E-X, then the letter V, and then Planis, P-L-A-N-I-S, wherever you get your podcast to hear that. That's right. And finally, if you're really missing us in the dark weeks, you can always join us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons get access to bonus content including our exclusive junk drawer show that is posted there every week the main show is dark. That means astonishing legends year-round. In fact, our last couple of guests were John Killian and then our friend Bradley Netherton, who just did an amazing guest spot talking about the UAP phenomenon and its influence on classic rock musicians like Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, and of course, one of our favorite but lesser-known Jims, Jim Sullivan. Yeah, that was great stuff. So in summary, check out Sugarbot Sweet Shop, The Midnight Library, XV Planis, Kolchak's Loop, which is Bradley Netherton's show, and our mm -hmm. very own Patreon-exclusive show, The Astonishing Junk Drawer. We're everywhere, all the time. Oh, by the way, <laughs> hello to Dave Shelley. Thanks for the wonderful yeah. email, Dave, and thanks for listening to us for so long. All right, let's dive into tonight's show. 
Well, you could believe Mr. Pecker. My name is Peck. Or you could accept the fact that this city is headed for a disaster of biblical proportion. What do you mean, biblical? What he means is Old Testament, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Real wrath of God type stuff. Exactly. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Kangaroos, dogs, calves. Deer, bears, escaped apes, oh my. You know, one of the more common explanations for a flap or what becomes a community or regional rash of sightings or encounters is people thinking it must have been some form of mass hysteria. But does that somewhat problematic and outdated label fit, by definition, what's actually going on when a group of people claims to have seen something extraordinary? Or is there a better and more accurate scientific way to look at how people behave when things like a wave of cryptid or UFO or some other series of 14 events happen? Hmm. Well, as we've said, high strangeness doesn't happen in a vacuum. Well, it probably does. <laughs> but what does that matter to us humans if no one is around to experience it? Just as important as the impossible event, at least to people anyway, to us, is how we react to it and try to derive meaning and significance from it. So that's what this episode is about, as we find it fascinating to also examine these scenarios from the standpoint of not only individual reaction, but also collective behavior and collective action. So I say if mainstream science, quote unquote, those aspects of the disciplines and departments like physics or chemistry, biology or zoology, for example, if they aren't interested in or capable of examining the objects and causes of paranormal events, then at least the social science of sociology can use its tools and methods to analyze how humans react to them. It turns out that a sociologist was intrigued enough with the Enfield case we talked about in our last episode that he was able to mobilize a scientific study of it in short order. Pretty cool. How often does that Not happen? Not very often. Not very. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we thought we should cover this. While his analysis was applied to that story, we realized it can also be applied to things like cases like the Warminster thing, Flap. Remember that? Yes. And to be fair, in the sociologist's textbook that he wrote later, which is pretty standard, I think very well received in its third edition, uh, he does cover the Warminster right, thing. Right, right, right. So, uh, this is why I love that textbook. I'm actually thinking of buying a textbook to read for fun. <laughs> He talks about all these things that we talk about, but he analyzes them from the perspective of a sociologist and with new, more modern ideas that we're going to take a look at here. In all my book collection, I don't have a lot of textbooks. I think we have two yeah, or three. Yeah, that's right. I think right. there's one, at least it looks like a textbook. It's a UFO research one. Right. But then uh, then the only other real textbook I have is an automotive mechanic one. <laughs> I love that one. It tells you how an engine works. I do have a lot of uh, Chilton's manuals and the, uh, what's, what are the, it's <laughs> a different yes. thing. Yes, well, that's good I stuff. I love yeah. taking things apart and I love this paper we're going to look at because that's exactly what it does with episodes like this. And you can also apply this to other things we've talked about and people know very well here, like the vanishing hitchhiker or the lady in white sightings. Remember those? Ah, uh, yeah. Resurrection Mary. But other flaps and, and waves, or even a, a wave of Bigfoot sightings. Yeah, and by the way, you, you kind of throw that word flap around a lot, <laughs> like everyone knows what it means. I, I, I don't hey, know. I don't know give, if everyone knows. Like, it's one of those words, it, it's not super clear where it no, came No, it's from. not. If you've been listening to us for a while or a, any of these types of shows, you will know. Uh, Rob Christofferson, our great friend, would psychically punch you around for not knowing that word because it's just it just yes. it's become adopted to that. But there's a lot of new listeners who haven't hit the backlog yet and may not know about that. So valid point. Okay, so from this website, eurofo.net, paraphrasing here, an entry by Eduardo Russo in 2019 about flaps, specifically as they relate to UFOs, quote, in UFO jargon, we speak of flaps to indicate concentrations of sightings in a certain area and in a limited period of time. I love that. Yeah, it's a good definition. Well, Mr. Russo goes on to say that the now prevalent theory on flaps is that they stir up reporting, and we're going to talk about that aspect too, but because he's Italian, he points to an Italian statistic that says that over 3 million people have been polled saying that they think they've seen a UFO, but there are only 30,000 reports, okay? 3 million people claiming that, only 30,000 reports. That's 1% 
of the total. Oh, that's interesting. So that's for Italy. I wonder if that stands for the whole world. I, I would put it this way. There are cultural differences, as we've talked about, like uh, South Americans aren't as hung up and their military leaders aren't as hung up about UFOs yeah. as they are here. Yeah. There's not so much of yeah. a stigma. Uh, so some cultures are just like, yeah, go to the Atacama Desert at night. You're going to see lights zigzagging in the sky, taking 90 degree turns and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Those aren't satellites. They are not as stigmatized, uh, these reports. So there might be more reports. Of course, here, we're all very, uh, you know, stick up this stuffy and uh, there's still a stigma. So a lot of people may have claimed that, but guess what happens? Another thing that we're going to cover tonight is when you do speak up, you are looked at funny. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, that's why people, uh, unless some, unless you don't care, or you're, maybe you're a bit eccentric or a character anyway, like uh, Mr. McDaniel, it's like, I don't like, look, dude, I've been through World War II, okay? <laughs> I've seen death yes. in the face. Your judgments on me of, of being a crackpot, I, I don't care about that. Yes. And folks, for those of you who don't remember who Mr. McDaniel is, Forrest is referring to Henry McDaniel, the original eyewitness of the infield monster in the last episode. Right. Uh, since we're kind of analyzing that event a little bit tonight. All right, so that's a great explanation on flaps. Yep, yep. Uh, How about this? Why don't you tell people a little bit about what's sociology? What exactly is sociology? I'm sure we've all taken social studies classes yes. in, in school. I hope you have. Uh, but I'm glad you asked because here's the deal. It's We could all use a refresher. Certainly, as I've gotten older, I've forgotten most of what I've learned in school. Uh, you probably forgot in the cold open. We just recorded it's, that it's a few often, ago. <laughs> It's always often, all of this is always often a problem. But let's, uh, we have at our, our fingertips here, the definition from Wikipedia. Sociology is a social science that focuses on society, human social behavior, patterns of social relationships, social interaction, and aspects of culture associated with everyday life. It uses various methods of empirical investigation. That's empirical meaning uh, stuff you can see and, and chart that's in front of you, the data that's in front of you. Empirical investigation and critical analysis to develop a body of knowledge about social order and social change. While well, some sociologists conduct research that may be applied directly to social policy and welfare, others focus primarily on refining the theoretical understanding of social processes and phenomenological method. Mm. Subject matter can range from micro-level analyses of society, individual interaction and agency, to macro-level analyses, uh, that is, uh, systems and the social structure. What we're talking about here with, I guess, these paradigmal flaps is then going to deal with the theoretical understanding, not about how do we, what do we do with these pesky people that claim to see weird stuff? Right, <laughs> we, right. How do we handle them? It's like, well, no, that's just going to keep happening. It always has, and it will continue. But how should we think about that? As it says here, refining the theoretical understanding of these processes, right, and the phenomenological method. So let's understand how people react when they do this, because, again, this is going to keep happening, folks, and it, and they always usually happen in the same pattern, but let's not paint them all with the same brush. Right, and this is where you get further and further down a rabbit hole, but one of the things mentioned above that Forrest brought attention to is empirical investigation. Yes, yes. The important thing here is that empirical evidence is critical to the sciences, and that's what we're talking about here tonight, in this case, a scientific evaluation. And Wikipedia points out that even those two words, empirical and evidence, when used together, have different definitions in different fields. For mm -hmm. example, let's look at yet another big word, epistemology. According to Britannica, epistemology is the philosophical study of the nature, origin, and limits of human knowledge. Quoting the entry for that, it is one of the four main branches of philosophy, and nearly every great philosopher has contributed to it. So why talk about epistemology? Because in that study of knowledge, philosophically, the definition of evidence is, quote, something that justifies beliefs or determines whether a certain belief is rational. That's quoting right. Wikipedia. And, and so is this. This is only possible if the evidence is possessed by the person, which has prompted various epistemologists to conceive evidence as private mental states like experiences or other beliefs. Uh explain that, sir. Well, so in that case, epistemology, the definition of evidence seems a bit subjective, just as it does in the case of the paranormal. Yes. Conversely, when it comes to the sciences, evidence is something entirely different. Evidence either confirms or disconfirms a scientific hypothesis. 
Mm -hmm. It points to a more binary solution. Either the theory is true and proven, or it's disproven. Everyone evaluating the evidence needs to be able to clearly experience the evidence with their senses, so scientifically, folks can come to an agreement. Right. When you're evaluating a paranormal event, whether it's the infield monster or some of these other flaps we're going to talk about tonight, applying mm-hmm. the scientific definitions of evidence to the situation when the epistemological definition is more suitable might not be giving you the whole picture. Did I say epistemological right? That's pretty close. I got it. Yeah, I understood. Okay. <laughs> After all, isn't evidence of the paranormal most about what, quote, justifies yeah. the belief? or figuring out what makes that belief rational. That's the epistemological definition of imperial evidence. I don't know if it's all the E's but uh, in the words, but I could see where people listening to this may not fully gel, as they yes, say. Yes, yes. My mind probably glazed over even as I was saying it is. But oh, okay. The, the sum up is the definition of evidence is not agreed upon across different areas of work. Right. It's not that one is right and the other is wrong. It's that it means different things to different people in different situations. So yes. we have to keep that in mind as tonight we discuss how it might apply to a paranormal event. Do you take a scientific approach or a more epistemological one? Why not both? Ooh. A couple of things here. When you evaluate any series of events you're looking at, it's not that you're going to use the wrong method of evaluation. It's that the one you choose affects the outcome of what you learn. And the second thing I will say here is that we get this all the time because it's just everywhere. And it's what people say is that I don't believe in X blank because there's no evidence for it. And I don't believe in stuff that I have no evidence for it. I can understand that, but I always counter with, well, It just depends on what you think is evidence. Exactly. People say, there's never any evidence of ghosts. It's like, there's a lot of photos. There's a a lot of videos. uh, There's a lot of audio recordings. There's, therefore, a lot of empirical evidence. Evidence that uh, you saw this mist come out of the closet that there's no explanation for. and You got a chill and blah, 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 and you heard a weird voice. That's what we're talking about. The evidence that is right in front of you. Now, you can't produce that or reproduce that in the lab, which is what people want. That's what people want, is that, well, no, the scientific method, you should be repeatable, and then... Where's the ectomist? Can you bring it in? We'd like to look at it under a microscope. (laughs) There was a a Russian locomotion scientist uh, who commented on the PGF, who validated it, or said, like, yeah, this looks like (laughs) not a man in a suit to me. Yeah. Just basically said about all the, uh, again... PGF being, by the the way... The Patterson-Gimlin film, yes. I'm I'm sorry. If I said it every time, I feel that you would yell at me just like, just say the PGF. People know what that is. No, I know. It's Astonishing Legends canon, but for people that are new to the show (laughs) or maybe they skipped our series on the Patterson-Gimlin film... If you hear PGF, that's what we're referring to, which is the Abraham Zapruder film of Big (laughs) Feats. It's that old movie of the one walking through the creek, and it is the one that makes up 98% of every Bigfoot sticker you've ever seen in your life. So Right, and I just read an article on how to submit an image or icon for an emoji, and it's about dang time that we had one of Patty in that that pose, because you look at that and everybody knows what that is. Yeah, especially since there's no copyright on her. That's right. Yeah, you can't copyright uh, Patty. She'd beat you up. We diverge. We the d- point is, what this scientist said from Russia, and again, they take this stuff more seriously, ironically, because they are more materialists. They don't get hung up on belief as much. It's like, well, if it's there, people are seeing it, there must be something there. Let's find out what it is. What he said was that you will not be satisfied till you've killed one and it's just in your lab or in your office, I think he said. You won't be satisfied till one's stuffed and standing in your office. And that's how people feel about this stuff. It's like they will say, until I can get some repeatable evidence of ghosts or any of this stuff, I'm not going to believe it. It's like, that's fair. I understand that. But it leads to my other thing, which I'm going to turn into a T-shirt, and it's the uh, the ghost in a jar. Oh, yes. I do like that. It's like, you won't be satisfied until you can buy a ghost in a jar and talk to it. And it's a, it's a little like the um, the Haunted Mansion Disney thing, where it's just you turn it on, there's a spiral of ghosts light up your... Uh, T-shirt. Yeah. We should actually make one. We should get that going in an Etsy All right. That's what I'm saying. A a a note before I forget it, jot that down. We'll get that going. Jotting it right now. If, or so, if you're a very talented Etsy 
<laughs> maker and you think you can make right. a really cool little ghost in a jar and scale it up in case a bunch of people want it, uh, get in touch with us. Well, <laughs> okay. Back to the conversation here. So tell us what you mean, what people need to understand. The most important thing to understand about this is that the very method that you use to evaluate yes. whatever you're looking at in life or in the case of this paranormal investigation, that defines the type of results you're going to get. But it doesn't mean that when you apply another method, that those results are invalid. You're just looking right. at things in a different way. That's one of my huge points I rested on is that everything is perspective, point of view, and guided by belief. So it yes. just depends on how you look at stuff and what you want to look at and what you want to dismiss and how you want to think about it. So you're saying that skeptics and believers alike, they can both be right about something at the same time, right? I believe that they can, and they can also both be wrong. That's true. I see it as, it's a little bit of a, an expanded cognitive dissonance where you can hold two opposing beliefs in your head at the same time and both think that they are true. Right. What's funny is that little kids do that to explain it a little bit, because I've uh, we talk about this quite a bit. The famous example is that you can show them a very, uh, a big vat, right? A big jar and a very tall one. And you can show them, look, look, each one has the same amount of liquid in it, right? Yes. Which one is bigger? And you've just shown them, it's like they can both hold the same exact amount of water and they, they will always say the taller one. Right. Because to them, tall means big. It's bigger than the fat one. Right. The tall one bigger than, and it's like, no, 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 you understand though. We just showed you, they hold the same amount. It's like, yeah, but which one's bigger? Right. The tall one. Right. So that's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance is that now you know that they're the same, right? Yes. But I still believe that the other one's bigger. Yes. So anyway, and then usually they grow out of that as, uh, as people get older, they, they get yeah, rid of Yeah, their minds that, change. Then, their, their brains change and they evolve in yes. their reasoning. And critical thinking evolves. Right. Yeah. All this is to say, perhaps that means that the truth, it's effectively a combination of simultaneous methods of evaluation, right? So we're going to take this all as a whole. Yeah. Getting away from the binary idea of all this, especially in the paranormal world, skepticism and belief are just two choices of what could be many more methods of looking at reality. Both yes. the normal and the paranormal and everything in between, including uh, sciences and applications that we haven't even conceived of yet. You're, you're now talking in circles, too. I know. Yes. I know. I am. Okay. I, I am. That's okay. I admit it. No, I, you're or not, am yeah, I? I? No, I, I get you. I get you. <laughs> Maybe you are. I don't know. Yes, yes, you are, let's say. Well, let's move forward here. What we really wanted to talk about tonight was that the research that was done after the Enfield monster case, we're going to look at that because it's a good framework here. It's classic. And because the Enfield case has been that well documented. And at that moment, immediately, as soon as, about as soon as you can, by sociologists, a team of sociologists from Western Illinois University, we have a great model to study here that's pretty well documented, okay? And then we can shine a light then on the intricacies of how a story like that unfolds, not only as an individual experience, but then as a regional folklore tale, to a national thing, to our passive, uh, aggressive judgments on it later. <laughs> and we can take that to the bank every time we look at a legend going forward. So we thought that this was very much worthwhile and that we'll all be armed now with a little more knowledge, which is a good thing. Or as my grandfather said, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. <laughs> and man, does that apply now. Yeah, and we also want to make it clear that when we talk about this paper tonight and some of these other science-based methodologies, this is the application of that, not only to the event we discussed in our last episode, but to the people that were part of that story. Researchers could easily apply a scientific evaluation to those people. It's safe to say yes. that pretty much everyone can agree the people meet the definitions of empirical evidence set forth by the philosophy of science. The peer-reviewed mm -hmm. paper we're going to discuss involves direct interviews with those people by researchers who saw them, heard them, and interacted with them. That's different from the stories of the infield monster, because the people are real, tangible assets that you can revisit and interact with. Exactly. And speaking of, the young man who claimed that the monster tore up his tennis shoes as it ran past him, he's about our age. Yes, you want me to track him down, don't you? Yes, you do that because, was it Michael uh, Gagnon uh, says about the, the, the drug henchlord in, uh, <laughs> henchlord in Lair Cake, <laughs> you can find any man on the planet in five minutes. I will deploy the Astonishing People Finder, or <laughs> APPLE, which is an acronym that we will nowhere near be able to use. No, uh, heck no. Not oh, because wait, not people will confuse that. It's APF. Doesn't even make Astonishing sense. Astonishing People Finder. Yeah. APPLE. APPLE. Where, where'd the L come from? There's no L in there. We're talking about as it applies to this story, because 
this young man at the age of 10 years old was interviewed. He and his family and his parents were interviewed by these sociologists we're going to talk about. That's right. And again, we're talking about uh, April 25th, 1973, a then 10-year-old Greg Garrett was playing in his backyard or front yard when he claimed that this horrific same creature appeared to him and either accosted him or it ran by him. It didn't really make sense. It's like would it come up and stand on his toes as a joke. Apparently, I read later that, uh, yeah, this thing ran at him, scared the crap out of him, ran by, and as it did, it tore up his sneakers with its claws. Right. And he ran inside the house crying and scared out of his wits. That was 30 minutes before Henry McDaniel had his sighting. So uh, the sociologist came by again, interviewed them both, and, and the parents said, well, no, we were just, we thought it'd be a, a fun prank to play on uh, Mr. McDaniel because he's a, he's kind of a goofy old neighbor and that'd be funny. And we also thought we'd put one over on the on the out-of-town journalist. And that's why we made that up, which may or may not be true. I want to hear from Mr. Garrett. Yes. Mr. Greg Garrett, who's about our, who's in, probably in his 50s by now. He's five years older than me, so he'd be... Right. Yeah, he might still be in his 50s, so that's good. Uh, if anyone knows Mr. Garrett, Mr. Garrett, if you're listening for some reason and you want to talk to us, we'd love to hear your story of it after so many years of what really went on. Was it just a prank or was there something more to it? So the people are real, their experiences are real right. or they're not real, but you can examine them and you can examine how people react to those stories. So you're spot on, my friend. Let's now start taking a look at that paper. And again, we're gonna use that as a framework for tonight's discussion, which will require some science-based tangents to set the scene for us. So the paper that we're going to outline tonight, you can find it on JSTOR. To warn you, you can get a preview of it, but unless you know somebody who is an academic or librarian, to download it from the JSTOR website is going to be $51. But we're going to follow the paper here, and uh, so you don't have to. I recommend getting the textbook. It's a lot more readable, and it's a lot of fun, and there's a lot more cases in there that are like this that are covered there and just present a different way of thinking. Not that the ideas that we're going to bring up we're going to debunk, scientifically. It's just another way and perhaps a more accurate way of looking at these types of cases as opposed to events like the Salem witch trials or the, the girls' school laughing fit. Right. So this paper is, uh, the lead author here is David L. Miller, along with other authors from the team here, Kenneth J. Mitas or Maitis, and Richard A. Mathers, A Critical Examination of the Social Contagion Image of Collective Behavior. So this came out in 1978 in the Sociological Quarterly 19, number one, volume number one here. Uh, you'll find that on page 129. And just to introduce David L. Miller, because I think this is fairly groundbreaking to me anyway, research and theory and sociological thought that really made an impression on me. And it's not somebody I studied in school, but I think we should know a little bit about him because he's, it's a more modern way of thinking about this and getting away from, and maybe some inappropriate concepts of things like mass hysteria, the, the, the hysteria part, especially a lot of people are going to have, uh, find a problem with, and that's the hist part of that. And that term is still being used, even though it is problematic, but maybe it's not even accurate in these kinds of cases. That's what we're going to take a look at. So in any case, I, I love Professor Miller's research and decades of this now, which turned into a, a textbook. I like this guy. I like his ideas because also he's not dismissive. It's uh, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the paper that was done about pseudoscience and Kelly Hopkinsville, but you can compare and contrast those in that the authors of that paper seemed a little dismissive. And that's the problem that we had with that is that they didn't go there and examine it. They just dismissed it as, well, look here, they were drunk, right? That's what somebody said. And they're probably not very smart people. So we can dismiss that whole case. Yeah. I didn't care for that. Here, he's saying like, let's not character assassinate the people. Let's see how they behave because we interviewed them. And we're not here to say that one person was lying or, or not, or even if this monster is real. We're not going to know that. But we can study how did everyone act when this happened. So another clarification I want to make uh, clear here is this David L. Miller is not the British sociologist David Miller born in 1964. Different David Miller also Different a sociologist. Different David Miller because yeah. somebody was like, hey, that guy is whatever, blank, fill in your blank. This is a different David L. Miller sociologist. He's a, a bit older. Our David L. Miller was born February 8th, 1944 in Mason City, Iowa, and he passed away in Springfield, Illinois on December 24th, 2018. Oh, Christmas Eve. David earned his BS from the University of Iowa in Iowa City, Iowa. 
his MS from the University of Columbia, South Carolina, and his PhD from the University of Illinois, all in sociology. His area of expertise was, quote unquote, collective behavior. Okay, so we're, we're setting the stage here, collective yes. behavior. That's the first term. A better, more accurate term, I believe, and uh, he did too. We'll post his obituary. That's what was uh, written about him. Sounded like a terrific educator all his life. David enjoyed a 35-year-plus career as professor of sociology at Western Illinois University. He enjoyed working with and in the company of the fourth floor Morgan Hall professors and staff. If anyone has gone there, you'll know what that is. You know, the other day I was thinking about how we probably could have started the show a year earlier than we did, but I was just waiting for the right time. Well, there was a lot of planning. I don't know, maybe too much? What do they say? Uh, perfectionism is the enemy of completion or something like that. Or maybe that's just what you say. Uh, well, yeah, a lot of people do say that, not just oh, me. And I, I feel like I'm finally starting to learn the value of just getting whatever it is that you want to do going. There's never a right time. You got to just go for it. Boy, that is so true. And these days, there's more tools out there to make that so easy to do, like Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one destination where, yeah, you can build a website for your business, but that's just the beginning of what you can do with it. It's one of the most powerful business tools on the internet that's available today. Yeah, for example, say you want to do what we do and start a podcast. With Squarespace, you can create member areas that work perfectly with your brand, and on top of that, make it easy for you to monetize your content. In fact, you can use those member areas to unlock new revenue streams for your show and, and free up time in your production schedule by selling access to gated content like videos and online courses or bonus content. And now there's built-in Squarespace Video Studio, where you can make and share engaging videos right there within Squarespace, which in turn grows your audience, enhances your brand, and drives your sales up. You can also connect with your audience with Squarespace email campaigns. There's no better way to engage your listeners and keep them involved in what you're doing. Squarespace makes that easy, with templates that make building a branded newsletter a piece of cake. Look, you know you've had that idea for a while now, right? It's never going to be the right time to get it going, so why not start now, today? Head on over to squarespace.com slash legends for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Stop putting it off. You know, Get to squarespace.com slash legends for that free trial, and, and once you've seen everything it can do for you, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Do you have a hate-hate relationship with your phone bill? Well, why wouldn't you? For decades, the entire wireless service business was dominated by what was essentially a big con. All kinds of hidden fees made up a big chunk of your overpriced bill, and you'd be locked into some absurd long-term contract that you have to offer up a body part to get out of. There's always a catch. Yes, but Mint Mobile is different. They don't have any retail stores, so there's not some huge cost from that that they're trying to pass on to you. And on top of that, Mint Mobile's premium service starts at just 15 bucks a month. I'm pretty sure the mystery fees on my old mm. big wireless provider bill were close to that by themselves. Well, you get the best rate whether you're buying for one or, like Scott, you want the service for a family. At Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep that same sweet phone number you've had for a while now, along with all of your existing contacts. Mm -hmm. No more new phone, who dis? <laughs> well, switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Evan Langshaw. Now, back to the show. Going on here, though, the antiquated and, again, I, I think problematic old term and explanation for this event, specifically Enfield and others like it, is mass hysteria. So this is the view that David L. Miller says at all. This Enfield event is better studied as an incident of collective behavior or the collective action perspective rather than an outdated theory of, quote unquote, mass hysteria. 
So again, don't write us letters. That's all the terms here. It's still being used because we are trying to be accurate. We are still calling it that. Yeah, and the reality is that after mass hysteria came social contagion as a term, but even that term is older now. But uh, concurrent with these ideas was another idea called crowd psychology, which was first talked about in the 1880s. Now, there's been a lot of debate across all these fields of discipline, and part of the problem with all of them is that most of them don't have a very clear definition of what they are individually. They're too amorphous, and therefore it becomes difficult to study them effectively, at least while applying the scientific method. It's almost like there might be an issue applying the scientific method to something that really is all about the very natural way that entropy or chaos develops. Not that mass hysteria, social contagion, and crowd psychology theories aren't necessarily chaotic, because you might be able to predict the behaviors of certain types of individuals within a crowd, but maybe not as those behaviors spread and influence others exactly which direction they may go, right? So, yeah, you can see how somebody's going to freak out about it, and maybe others adapt that, but not in a general sense and not perhaps significantly, right? Yeah, and here's something I thought was interesting I stumbled across during our cursory research here. Uh, This comes from Ralph Turner, PhD, and another gentleman named Lewis Killian. They had a theory called emergent norm theory, and this one posits that the very idea of what is normal emerges Mm. from a crowd. I'm taking this from an article on thoughtco.com posted in June of 2019 by Ashley Crossman. Turner and Killian argue that the norms that ultimately govern a situation may not be initially apparent to the participants. Instead, norms emerge through a process of social interaction in which people look to others for cues and signs indicating various possibilities of what they might expect. Emergent norm theory explains that collective behavior has a long history of turning violent, such as in the cases of mobs and riots. However, collective behavior also applies to fads that can cause some good, like the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. That's an example of collective behavior that raised money towards medical research. It's funny to me, like from a comedy point of view, if you think about like three people in a room and one does something really stupid or uh, whatever, and then the other two have to decide whether they're going to laugh at it or (laughs) go and help the person. Like if they, you know, like if if you're the person that laughs at people that trip and fall, like, so if you have 10 people who, and eight of them are laughing at the person who fell, right? do the other two do that? Or do they go and try to help the person up and see if they broke their ankle? Or have you read Lord of the Flies? Talk about Emergent Norm. (laughs) Just outstanding book, but it's about them deciding what's normal in their isolated little community, and it's not good for them. <laughs> you you want to you want to see it in a safe uh, distance and at a pretty common one. Look at the comments section of YouTube or yes, even our own Facebook group. I call it the trash can through the window. As soon as somebody does that, the first one to do that, it's like, oh, well, they did it. This is okay now. Yeah. Now I can air my grievances, even right. though it's not Festivus. They broke the ice with that one, so it now lets others go in and to explore something that might be touchy or even not totally accepted, but you feel better seeing other people do it. It's like, okay, now we're all, and it just builds. Uh, We see so much of that nowadays. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about too. How do people get swept up into these fads and crazes and possibly seeing things that aren't there? Yeah. Here's my point though. One thing that may have been seen that was unusual, but everything that followed was that exactly the same thing. Or was it different or nothing at all? Okay, are we getting a little astray here? I, I don't think so because this is all, these are all very important ideas. Yes, they are. And and, and I'm done with that one. Uh, but there is one other one I want to touch on, and that's social identity theory. Okay. Anyone who's, frankly, who's been alive, these are going to sound like, oh, yeah, I've never really thought about this, but that's what it is in some cases. Other people who are philosophers, you maybe you sit and think about it under a tree every day. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, uh, this one is simpler, and it's attributed to Henry Tajvel, uh, a mm-hmm. Polish social psychologist who was known for studying the cognitive aspects of prejudice and social identity. Unfortunately, his reputation was later tarnished by accusations of sexual harassment. So oh, notably, he <laughs> never considered gender's effect on social identity theory. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But uh, according to a uh, Dr. Saul McLeod, who wrote this article at simplypsychology.com in 2019, Tofjell suggested in 1979 the following, quote, groups, uh, for example, social class, family, uh, football teams, etc., which people belong to were an important source of pride and self-esteem. 
Groups give us a sense of social identity, a sense of belonging to the social world. Mm -hmm. We divided the world into them and us based through a process of social categorization. Dr. McLeod goes on to write, Henry Tajfell proposed that stereotyping, uh, i.e. putting people into groups and categories, is based on a normal cognitive process, the tendency to group things together. In doing so, we tend to exaggerate, one, the differences between groups, two, the similarity of things in the same group. This is known as in-group, us, and out-group, them. The central hypothesis of social identity theory is that group members of an in-group will seek to find negative aspects of an out-group, thus enhancing their self-image. Prejudiced views between cultures may result in racism. In its extreme forms, racism may result in genocide, such as has occurred in Germany with the Jews and Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis, and more recently in the former Yugoslavia between the Bosnians and the Serbs. Mm. There's more to that article, uh, which we'll have a link to, but I'm just going to jump down to the conclusion here. Very apropos to everything going on these days. Right now in Ukraine, specifically. All right, so here's the conclusion of that. Just to reiterate, in social identity theory, the group membership is not something foreign or artificial, which is attached onto the person. It is a real, true, and vital part of the person. Again, it is crucial to remember in-groups are groups you identify with. And out groups are ones that we don't identify with and may discriminate against. Okay. So, yeah. And, and that speaks a lot to conspiracy theories. Yes. In that it is a special group. You now have special knowledge about something. Everyone else is foolish. And then I would say on the flip side of that is that sometimes there are little weird true things that fuel these ideas. Little oddities that can't be explained that you can point to and say, well, what about that? And you can't explain it away. Yeah, this goes back to, as our friend Laurie Williams says, Oog and Og in the first cave, uh, probably <laughs> right. you know, trying to figure yeah. out who they wanted to hang out with that night. Yeah, um, it, this, this is how humans behave. So it's like, I know we always just look at the notifications popping up in front of our eyeballs, but none of this is new. And that's what we're going to take a look at here tonight in some of these more famous cases that you will have heard about. And how does this apply? Because... Again, it starts to, uh, does this go to a conspiracy theory of like the government's testing stuff on us and uh, that's why this is happening? Or is it fallout for something else? Or is it Fortean? It just happened. It fell from the great Sargasso Sea and uh, we're now just trying to explain it away. So that was a lot of theories on group behavior right there, Yeah, right? yeah, it is. And, and that's as far as I'm going to go on those last two because they're not necessarily at the heart of what we're talking about here tonight particularly as it relates to a paranormal event and how that event unfolds. But but what I want to say about all this stuff that's at play is that, and many more things that I pointed out earlier haven't even been written about yet, what I'm talking about is quantifiable scientific-based theories as well as possible paranormal ones that we might not yet understand. Mm -hmm. Not to get too kitchen sink on it all, but what I'm saying is that in the case of a mass paranormal sighting, whether it be something like Enfield or something with even more witnesses, like the Shag Harbor incident, the, right. the Phoenix Lights or the aerial school sighting in Zimbabwe, you can understand even how between the witnesses and those questioning the event, things could evolve into a social identity crisis. Us, the experiencers, versus them, the non-believers or the questioners. Right. It reminds me of then Governor Five Symington having to side with, you know, make fun of it and yes. bring a somebody in a costume because I can't say like, yep, folks, that was real. Start panicking and dig your shelters now. Right. Authority figures are responsible for keeping order, not inciting action to unknown, but saying like, look, this is what we know now. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah, because invariably, if you're calling a press conference, you're standing in front of a room full of people that are trying to figure out whether or not their hair's on fire. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, let's not forget mass psychogenic illness, which is, that's yet another version of all the aforementioned theories that incorporates uh, a new aspect. And that's actual physical symptoms. And it's a very real powerful thing. We should make fun of it. Yeah. The mind is so fascinating. So, okay, you've heard of this, right? This would be, I guess, a more appropriate description is how we think about the dancing plague. Yes. Everyone had the same identifiable symptoms. People died from exhaustion, dancing too much. That's right. And uh, they could not stop even though they wanted to. So again, as we look at David Miller's paper, I wanted to cite another example of something, uh, uh, an event that would fall into these analytical categories, but also one that's it's, it's mentioned a lot in sociological circles as a great case of this. 
But I have to admit, even being from the region, I wasn't familiar with this. Well, I, I wasn't born in 1954, many Wait, people what, think. what region? What, where is this from? Washington State, Seattle. That's oh. way far oh. from me. But that's your general region. Yeah, people it? know that I uh, I did go to the University of Washington for two years. So I and I have still plenty of friends there. But still in school? They no, have no, time? no. They've uh, oh, long okay. since graduated. But uh, it, yes, contrary to popular belief, I am still not that old. But this was quite a thing. And I asked uh, one of my good friends that I met in college who still lives there. He's one of my best friends. Uh, if he remembered this or or remembered the older folks talking about this. And he said, well, not really. But then again, people's personal histories when they were younger, around that time, people didn't take thousands of selfies. <laughs> they they didn't jot things down in journals a lot. So that that's a, a dark period for a lot of folks. But this is one of the cases cited as possibly being some form of what at the time was defined as mass hysteria or what now might be called social contagion. This is called the Seattle Windshield Pitting Wave of 1954. Wait, so this, this is a wave, not a flap. It could be. <laughs> stop making me crazy. <laughs> this could be both. Uh, it depends on how you. Is well, no. Wave? What's it's, the difference between a wave and a flap? Well. Uh, and we're not talking about airplanes. No, no, no. There, here's the, okay. here's the, th the thing is that it depends, I think, also how it's branded. It's like there's a wave of cattle mutilations, not a flap. I feel like a wave has to do with time and a flap might have to do with geography. How about that? Yes, but as we explained earlier, the flap... More with geography. Right, the flap There's is... There's a Venn diagram. Right, it's a limited period of time. So right. perhaps the other way around, wave is, it comes in waves, right? A right. You don't just get one wave in the history of oceans. You might get a series of waves and it dies down. So the waves are always there. Like It's like cattle mutilations have always been going on. But you right. might have a flap, let's say, owing to Charles Fort, of weird things falling from the sky large rocks that come down, but they don't seem to do too much damage, as he thought. Or, again, it blows my mind, uh, a shower of meat. Yeah, the meat in, shower. In Kentucky, right? Black rain. This is a little bit like that. That's why I also wanted to talk about this. It's fascinating as a case in that you can't just totally wave it away. Now, there's some plausible explanations for this, and maybe more so than Fort had with frogs, because as he said, you know, people thought that, okay, so a, a whirlwind scooped up a bunch of tadpoles, they got carried into the sky, they hatched and rained down. Well, okay, that makes sense, except that the frogs reported coming down were mature frogs. So what, they stayed up there for weeks and ate and matured and were comfy and then just kind of came back down to earth when they got mature. I've seen this idea uh, time and again in our research. It's the yeah. stressful cultural triggers in the zeitgeist are all that it takes to set the ball rolling for these types of events to start unfolding or blossoming. It can. But is that, again, what's going on when people see a lot Not of three-legged weird uh, But it does seem plausible <laughs> in no. some cases, though. Look, there's always, there's always social pressures going on, man. Yeah. I say this to people. Not derisively, but they'll say like, oh man, you know, times are horrible now. And it's like, everything sucks. And it's like, well, when was better? Yeah. Give me a decade that was better. Oh, the seventies, man, you had disco. It's like, yeah, you had the Vietnam War yeah. too. You had Watergate. You had, again, everything that's going on with Enfield. Like it, there's always sucky things going yeah. on. Yeah. So my point here is that we've always got stressors. We just talk about them differently now and remember them differently. So you're right here. But to go on with this, and again, this article was written, uh, it was updated April 2nd, 2012, so a little while ago. So some of these, again, with the banding about of the term mass hysteria, may not be so forthfully done, especially on a news platform like HuffPo, Huffington Post. But the article was written by Scott Mendelson, MD, so he's a doctor here, and he's a contributor to HuffPost.com. And he starts off in the article mentioning the 12 teenage girls that were from Leroy, New York, or Leroy. Again, you know, people, I just, I can't look up every place name. <laughs> that it's looks to small. me, I mean, if it's spelled the way that we have it here in the outline, it looks like Leroy. Yeah. Or it could be, uh, yeah, it's something you're not going to expect. Yeah. Okay. That's all I can say about Southern Illinois <laughs> and those darn place names. Perhaps this is a chance to redeem ourselves from the, the other uh, Enfield episode we just did where Sarah, our editor, felt compelled to record a disclaimer. It upset her so much. <laughs> She's upset. She just wanted to set the record straight <laughs> for our goofs, which we played. We thought it was hilarious and uh, and loved it, so we, we ran it. But my point being here is that you can't go off of common sense or logical things because 
Southern Illinois, and I think I said Southeastern Illinois, but I think I read that from Coleman's book. I didn't get that on my own. I didn't make that up. It's just Southern Illinois is the region, but it's also known, uh, the region's known as Little Egypt, right? Right. For the conditions that were like the fertile Nile Valley, Crescent, blah, blah, blah. And you would think that, okay, so if you're naming the towns after them, then Cairo, Illinois, would be Cairo, like the Cairo in Egypt. Nope, it's Cairo. Right, well, that's because back when they named the towns, <laughs> accents were more prominent. That's the same thing here in North Carolina. There's a lot of cities here, or or when you look at uh, yeah. Point Pleasant and the Mothman right across the river, Gallipolis, right. which is Gallipolis. Well, Gallipolis yeah. in, in yeah. Australia, yeah. Gallipolis. Gallipolis, Gallipolis. It's just go with what you don't think it's going to be. Yeah. It's not Carmi, it's Carmi. I have a friend who lives in upstate New York from, uh, it's not Pulaski with an I, it's Pulaski right. with an I. It's going to be the opposite. You're going to get it wrong. They do that on purpose just to make fun of outsiders. And then I looked up a bunch of uh, videos from the area here, and there are several variations. There's Cairo, there's Cairo, and there's Cairo, depending on who you are in your so culture. But all this is tying back now to Leroy, New York, which I have just, <laughs> exactly. while, during while you were sourcing material yeah. for that rant, right. I'm going to say that I found Dr. Drew talking about the very case you're about to bring up on a YouTube video, yeah. and he said Leroy. So I'm going to go with Leroy, not Leroy, uh, I don't, Leroy. I don't, yeah. Leroy, New York. Okay, well, we don't know. And, uh, and frankly, folks, we all love you. Everybody loves each other. <laughs> If you don't from there, nobody cares. <laughs> That's the point. Nobody cares. <laughs> anyway, huge, uh, one of our classic tangents here. So anyway, uh, getting back to Leroy here, uh, there was a case here which was pretty interesting. 12 teenage girls, all simultaneously about, uh, started exhibiting symptoms of Tourette syndrome. That means they were they were stuttering, jerking, flailing about. Afterwards, or immediately afterwards, a neurologist diagnosed them with conversion disorder, quote unquote, that's the term, and it went away. So yes, they had physical manifestations of something. It was very real, but it wasn't as if they had tumors or neurological problems. And some, as we've said here, have speculated this to be a cause, conversion disorder, of the things like the dancing plague of 1518 that we just mentioned a few moments ago. And we've mentioned this on the show quite a bit, haven't we? Yeah, the dancing plague. This is actually the fifth time we've mentioned this on the show. We talked about it during <laughs> the Mary go. Celeste series, the Mothman right, yeah. series, who I just referenced, the Pied Piper series, and La Bête du Gévaudan, or the Beast of Gévaudan. Yeah, another creature where people are, oh my God, we've all seen the creature. Yeah, right. People would like to say that's conversion disorder, okay? And it's easier to do. Except yeah. that sometimes, I mean, you look at the Beast of Gévaudan, what was an uh, inordinate number of people were killed and dismembered. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a real thing, but yeah. it's, well, that's just a big dog. I mean, I or shouldn't be laughing a, at that, by the way, but it was it was a long time ago, so give me a break. Tragedy plus time, it's, comedy. I, mean, I wouldn't say comedy, oh, but okay. it's it's okay now, I would say. Okay uh, the, the, <laughs> the point with that, though, is that, again, people will say, well, that was just a guy. Yeah, he wanted the reward money and he hated the, uh, the, the soldiers, so he dressed up in the hides or he dressed his dog up, or it's just, you get all kinds of crazy stuff, okay? Because yeah. it just, yeah. I, it, that's crazy, it doesn't make sense to me. We'll put it that way. Well, look, there's a reason that it keeps coming up, obviously, and it's one of our points here for you listeners tonight, is that, you know, it might be a little sloppy to slap one of these vague theories on every paranormal thing that seems to happen, all right? One of them absolutely might be in play, either to a small or even a more significant extent, but that still leaves the possibility that the origin seed of some paranormal event evolved into uh, what we call an astonishing legend, and it, either it exists or it doesn't exist, irrespective of how you evaluate the story after the fact, right? That's right. And on top of that, whichever theory you apply is only going to address the situation within the framework of that theory that you're applying. Right. You won't be, as we recently said, Chuck Fort was the first to do, <laughs> thinking outside the box. Please stop calling him Chuck. I will accept Shant. Chick. No. Chick Fort. No. The HuffPost article author, then they go on to describe conversion disorder, which is something we should also all understand because, again, it comes up so much in things like this that we talk about. So why not? Anyway, I thought it was a good explanation here from the article. Quote, conversion disorder is a psychiatric rather than neurological disorder. 
it arises out of the way one uses his or her brain rather than from some lesion, infection, or injury of their brain tissue. Yet it is critical to understand that victims of conversion disorder do not fake symptoms. They are convinced their physical symptoms are true and their suffering is genuine. While more often seen in women than men, one of the most dramatic forms of the disorder, so-called hysterical blindness, has been exploited in many an old war movie plot. The brave soldier witnesses the horrors of combat and then awakens, unable to see, though with no evidence of anything being wrong with his eyes. After a great emotional catharsis, he suddenly sees again and returns to the battle, and such cases have been described in the annals of psychiatry and neurology. Yeah, and I, I just want to quickly add this one sentence description from Dr. Yeah. Google. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> oh, webmd.com. Yes, right. uh, Conversion disorder is a condition in which you have physical symptoms of a health problem, but no injury or illness to explain them. Right, there you go. So continuing on here, this disorder is thought to be driven by a subconscious attempt to convert a strong, unbearable emotional or sexual thought into something more socially acceptable. Moreover, whereas individuals can exhibit conversion disorder, it is not all uncommon for more than one individual to share in this trick of the mind. The sufferers can reinforce the behavior in each other, particularly if they share a common set of beliefs and are burdened by similar anxieties and fears, like students. You're all stressed, you're all in a social clique, this can happen, and they think that's the root of that. So it is astonishing how many individuals uncritically accept magical powers of the mind over the body and the material world, such as in the laws of attraction, the secret, and other such nonsense. That, again, that's Dr. Mendelssohn, of course. Yes. But are unwilling to accept the well-established fact that fear and anxiety can distort perception and create delusion. Unfortunately, during episodes of mass hysteria, the absurd becomes plausible and the scientific suspect. Now, this PuffPo article goes on to cite the Salem witch trials, of course, as an episode of conversion disorder and mass hysteria. Also, what's known as, quote, the phantom anesthetist of Mattoon, or the mad gasser of Mattoon. Tess wrote a great little summary blog article on our website. We'll have a link to that. Or you can just go to the website and search for it. It's right there. She does a great job on those. That happened in September 1st, 1944 in Mattoon, Illinois. Or maybe it's Matone. I don't know. You <laughs> Don't send us an email. I, I don't care. Again, that's a case that the article says where fear escalated to a point where armed gangs of men began eventually driving around the neighborhoods looking for the perpetrator. And also, that happened in the Seattle windshield pitting of 1954. So that's another phase of something like this, like a monster sighting. It, I call it the tortures and pitchfork phase. Yes. I'm sure somebody else has. Yes, I, just, I just like that. Okay. Yeah, like Kill that. the monster! That's what's happening here. It's like, we're going to get this guy. Of course, nobody ever gets found, as happened in Mattoon. But people swear they saw a weird dude spraying sickeningly sweet gases that made them woozy. So this article ends with uh, saying the phenomena of conversion disorder and mass hysteria have likely been around since the beginning of human history. Though we have advanced as a species, the thin veneers of modern science, technology, and instantaneous communications have not altered the underlying nature of the human mind. Episodes of conversion disorder and mass hysteria will almost certainly continue to erupt in our country and around the world, and they will increase in frequency when times are trying. They need to be addressed with sensitivity, understanding, and authority, and not by allowing fanciful notions to proliferate. So again, the doctor is applying that to the windshield pitting incident in 1954 coming out of Seattle, but is that totally accurate in that it's conversion disorder or mass hysteria? I don't think so. And now we go back to the article, which I think explains it. And there's another sociologist that they quote, I think has a great explanation for something like that as a sociological event, All right. not what's causing it. But it's also fun to talk about what may cause it too. That's why I throw it in there. It's like, I, I thought it'd be fun to, for us to discuss. So getting back to that. Getting back to the windshield pitting now. Yes, everything's connected, trust us. Right. Or Look, it's just, just go along for the ride. What else are you doing? I, I'm enjoying it. As we've always said, the show is about anything we find interesting. If you're not on board, we understand. <laughs> Continuing on here, here's how that, that event laid out. And I'm going to pull some of this from that article. So this glass pocking, as we talk about the pitting here, it was first noticed in Bellingham, but then it was noticed in other Washington communities. So uh, as people here, Anacortes, Oak Harbor, 
you know how to say Anna Quartz or whatever. Yeah, you know Anna Quartz. Because it's your That's part, right. your general <laughs> region that you're Although I, I have to admit, uh, I was rightfully corrected by a, a fantastic listener because I said Moscow, Idaho. Oh, and it's yes. Moscow, like Costco. Moscow. And I, I should know that. But I've been away for so long, I'd forgotten. And I've been to Costco a lot more than I had been to, uh, that I've been to Moscow, Russia. <laughs> Moscow, Idaho. That's my point. You move away, you kind of forget. It was a momentary lapse on my part. I apologize, and I should know better, but uh, that it can happen. Cairo, Cairo. All right, whatever. Uh, let's see. Cairo. <laughs> so here's the deal. Cairo. This got so big, the governor of Washington had to weigh in a team of university scientists, and even President Dwight D. Eisenhower became aware of this event because people were like, what's going on here? Is this nuclear testing? What's happening here? As it says here, it, it was quoting, yeah, Dr. Uh, David L. Miller about nuclear testing. And, uh, you know, that's what was going on with the anxiety of the nation at the time. And people thought, cosmic rays? It was, it's the 50s. It's sci-fi. H-bomb tests. All kinds of weird stuff's happening. But this is going on. And again, is this just hyped up hysteria, copycat vandalism, bizarre repercussions from nuclear testing, which we've all experienced, the article says, and it also cites the witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts as a, as a different kind of thing. So here's what's interesting about the incident, though. And again, if you're interested in learning more about this, go to History Link. We'll have that. And it's a repository of Washington State history. There is a quote from them um, as an article here saying that, quote, Seattle's police crime laboratory had to take a look at it because law enforcement, of course, had to take a look at it. In 1954, they examined 15,000 windshields and they discovered that about 3,000 of them had actually been damaged. So a lot of reports of people, again, windshields from cars that yeah, spend exactly. their entire lives driving down freeways. You want to go there right now? How many Let's times have you there. had a rock uh, hit your windshield, right? Me? I mean, these are more modern windshields, uh, but they had safety glass back then. This is 1954. This is not I've had a rock hit my windshield three times. Four right. Did it start well, a star? Did it, did it create a divot, a star? It depends on the situation each time. That's what different. I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever found uh, or looked at a pit where it didn't star? You know what I mean by star crack? And then sometimes usually those will spread and then you got a crack going all the way across your windshield. Yes. I mean, and as a car collector, I have replaced a few pitted windshields. Of right, but did they have, a, when you say pitted though, did it have the circular, you know what I'm saying, where it makes a circular pattern? Yes. And sometimes you can take epoxy, or a company will do that for you, where they inject epoxy into that, and it, it turns it clear again, better. and it's yes. fine. Yeah. But they can't help you when there's a crack. This is a little different, I, I feel, by right. the descriptions here. So they took a look at them, and again, Seattle's Police Crime Laboratory, according to this History Link article, quote, declare that all the damage reports were composed of 5% Hoodlumism and 95% public hysteria. 5% what? Hoodlumism. Hoodlumism? Who said that word? <laughs> that was the uh that was a Seattle Police Crime Laboratory result. Is that most of this is just people going uh, wacko about it and 5% of these cases. Well, well, look, they think it's hoodlums. It could be something is actually pitting these windshields. That's the point here, right? Right, right, right. Now, residents of Puget Sound had unwittingly become participants in a textbook example of collective delusion. Still part of the quote. By April 17th, 1954, the pitting incidents abruptly ceased. So it went away. But it wasn't just Seattle here, right? Reports started coming in around the country. Now, this is where it's interesting. The International News Service noted on April 19th, 1954, pitted windshields were being reported in at least nine states and Canada. The residents of California, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, Oregon, and Wisconsin, as well as Washington, told authorities that mysterious marks were all showing up on their car windshields. In Mount Pleasant, Michigan, pock marks were found on the glass panes of greenhouses. Not just cars. But not the cars themselves? Not on the paint? No. This is what I'm saying. Don't just throw the Although paranormal baby out with I mean, your whatnot. Maybe they're waxing it and they don't see it. I don't well, know. okay, that's part of it. I don't want to jump ahead here. Here's the other thing. Other places, airplane cockpit glass was said to be affected. It's not just road dirt, perhaps, being kicked up. That's what you... You never follow a gravel truck too closely. Yeah. You're going to get a chip in your windshield and it's going to chip your paint 
and probably the front end of your car. That's what happens. This is just windshields here. So this is another curiosity pointed out by the article. There's no pitting on the windows of homes. Nobody's shooting tiny pieces of sand at people's windows on their homes, at their homes. On the side windows of these cars or any other vertically positioned glass, there is no pitting, just the windshields or glass that is flat to the sky, parallel to the sky, not perpendicular. Keep that in mind because we can look at this logically. So one observer from the International News Service, which reminds me of a coal shacks, independent news service, the INS, I love that, out of Chicago. They observed that like, this is, okay, logically then, this has gotta be coming straight down from the sky, probably at a high altitude. That's one theory, right? It's not coming vertically. It's not being shot at. It's not being kicked up by other cars. This is happening to glass that's not on cars and exposed to the sky, right? In Canton, Ohio, a thousand residents notified police that their windshields had been blemished in some mysterious manner. Uh, the Daily Mail newspaper of Hagerstown, Maryland reported on April 17th, and United Press in New York uh, noted on April 20th that, quote, new reports of mysterious windshield pittings came in today almost as fast as theories about what causes them, end quote. A Canadian scientist posited that the marks were made by the skeletons of miniature marine creatures that have been propelled into the air by hydrogen bomb testing in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, I mean... As I describe this, it's being picked up, like Enfield. The story's being picked up. Other people are starting to notice it. Hey, this is happening by here. By the way, the International News Service uh, was its own thing. In May of 1958, it merged with rival United Press, and that's why that's now UPI, United ah, Press International. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Very nice, man. Yeah, so other theories are coming in, of course, of what's happening here. Utah, somebody suggested acid from flying bugs might be the source of windshield pitting. A Brigham Young University biologist disproved that theory, though, that was posted in the Provo Daily Herald and reported on June 27th. So as the summer, though, continued on, the reports decreased and finally just went away. So it's a mystery. It doesn't totally tick all the boxes of just being like, well, it's a bunch of nothing. But <laughs> Dr. Middleson will say, like, it was a bunch of nothing. It's just the way that people be behaved and reacted to this. Well, well, perhaps, or maybe there's something more to it. But going on to the other thoughts of the sociologists here, media, as we've just pointed out, has a lot to do with this and how things are reported. So uh, as we'll see, it's often partly the blame, maybe a lot of, of the blame at shoulders here for making something out to be bigger than it really is. And we should all keep that in mind as we consume news at the moment, hitting us from every possible angle, unlike the windshield pitting. We are bombarded with notifications. We are bombarded with headlines that may or may not be accurate. Yeah, you know, it's funny you should say that. Just this morning, I was thinking about, as we were recording this today, and I knew this section was coming up, I was thinking about how, about that very idea, and it was a report on Ukraine, suggesting uh, it, there were missile strikes yesterday, I think, in uh, Mariupol or somewhere. No, no, I think it was Odessa. It was in Odessa. And there were two competing sources of information. One suggested that the strikes were pretty accurate, and one of them may have even been that hypersonic missile that Russia has that is indefensible. It's 10 times the speed of sound or whatever. And then there's a completely other report from the Ukrainian army saying, no, this was a bunch of vintage Soviet-era missiles that are imprecise and striking civilian targets. So you don't know which thing is which. Now, of course, there's propaganda value for Ukraine to say all they have is old junk that barely works. So maybe that's what that is, and they're covering up the fact that they were still using some high-tech stuff, and they're just fighting a propaganda war. But that that goes very much to your point of, like, you don't know what the source is. And anytime you look at something, especially when something very newsworthy is happening, like something is uh, unfolding, a bank robbery or some other kind of thing, uh, or even 9-11, and I, because I remember, there is a ton of misinformation out there. On the morning of 9-11, there were stories of all these other aircraft that were on their way to other targets that didn't exist. And they were lots of places reporting on them. So it's, it's a really valid point. Now, here's the thing. Those of us who have studied communications, particularly mass communication, like Forrest and I, all studied that point in history where newspapers, and I'm just talking about papers here in the old days, evolved and diverged on different paths, as some editors realized that if it bleeds, it leads, which is uh, a quote that applies not only literally to the salacious ability of a good old-fashioned unsolved homicide to sell copies of the paper, 
but even more figuratively to applying strange details to any story. Details that can often be made up or fudged to make the story more interesting, compelling, and thereby sell more newspapers, increasing circulation, which in turn increases ad rates, which makes the papers more money, and there you have a vicious circle. Conversely, there are folks out there who readily identify that kind of content and rapidly consume news that they feel is not tainted with those kinds of facts too. And they generate high circulation numbers and sales for the opposite viewpoint, which calls back to the social identity theory that we mentioned earlier and the whole idea of us versus them. You can see how complicated things get very quickly. Oh yeah. However, in the early days of journalism, the sensationalist papers known as yellow journalism, named after a famous comic strip called The Yellow Kid from Joseph Pulitzer's New York World paper, that was the big seller. So journalism, in quotes, found that it could be rewarded for exaggerating stories. And as we just talked about a few episodes ago with Charles Fort, who wanted nothing more than to be a newspaper reporter, he made more money when there were more words, as did everybody (laughs) back then. Well... (laughs) So what happens when you run out of details but are trying to pay your rent? Add some language in and you get paid. But then when you step back and look at all of this, you begin to understand how large swaths of the media are, as, as Forrest said, it, not, maybe not necessarily to be trusted right out of the gate. You got you to take everything in with a grain of salt and you got to think right. about the, uh, especially when it comes to your own social identity. Where, where are these things coming from? Look, folks, this is very quickly, of course, made political and the politicalization of this. We're vaguely and obliquely covering politics through the paranormal. Nobody <laughs> does that. Astonishing <laughs> legends, everybody. Look, man. Everything is political. Everything is more importantly philosophical because I see philosophy as we talked about at the beginning of this. It's how we think about stuff. Our brains, everything's emanating from this. Maybe we're imagining all of this. Maybe you're just a figment of my imagination. Well, I have to go with that. That's the hand I've been dealt. And if I'm going to do that, how do I think about this? What do I think about this? So in politics and belief falls under that. But what we're talking about here is it happens on all sides. But people here, as you said, your, your identity is like, well, that doesn't happen on our side. Our side doesn't do that. We're above that. Right. No, you're not. Right. Because people are people. Here's what I've noticed and what I try to do with all the uh, vast amount of headlines here. And we see stuff. And, and what's funny is that I'll see one thing. It's like, oh, man, my phone's going to blow up here. Somebody got caught doing this. Something happened. Now you're going to get a bunch of uh, notifications, and uh, yes, I do have them all. A lot of them turned on, but it's interesting to see how they are worded. What people say, what journalists say, whoever's writing these headlines, and also what they leave out, what they don't say. And I have a collection of them, and I read from the left to the right, and everything in between as much as I have time for, and I try not to do too much because that just... It could just bum you out and you you can't overload on news. So don't do it too much, folks. Indeed. But I just noticed the patterns and it gives me a chuckle because it's like, oh, you see, well, this this news outlet, they didn't mention this fact here or this detail. And then the other one made a big deal of it. Well, what's going on there? Well, obviously, yes, that's bias. So moreover, I just want some phrasing to stop. Like, I'm tired of people breaking their silence. So-and-so breaks their silence after a long silence of not being broken. It's just, just be more creative. <laughs> just, they're going to the same tropes. I'm just, you just read, anyway, it's just yeah. funny. I don't, I don't yeah. really care. It's just, you see the same <laughs> things. It's like, okay, so did you borrow that phrasing? It's like, one weird trick to whiten your whatnot. I don't care what body part it is. Just, it's one, it's like three people writing everything. Just right. people, get more creative. Well, <laughs> But here's what we can suss out as a viewpoint, sociologically, that gets back to the NPR paper here, the article, uh, NPR History, which uh, I love those. Those are a lot of fun. But they talked to another sociologist from Missouri State University, Dr. David Rohall. And he's taught courses in social movements and collective behavior for more than a decade. And this article, of course, came out a few years ago. Just uh, for a little guidance here, we can examine what... uh, Rohal has to say about this. So what are the causes of uh, this windshield pitting? Is it really something causing this, an outside external force, or is it just people noticing it now? What he says is, quote, much of what happens in society is a numbers game, Rohal says. If you have more people, any phenomenon starts to appear more common if you focus on any one event or behavior. 
even something that is very infrequent, like a monster sighting, uh, I'm saying that, or windshield pitting here, may start to appear to be a trend, he says, when you aggregate those events. There are millions of cars in Washington state, but thousands of cases of pitting. While thousands sounds like a huge phenomenon, it represents less than 1% of cars. If everyone is looking and reporting it, it would appear to be a conspiracy of some sort. End quote. Uh, the article says, uh, you know, since there was physical evidence of this windshield pocking, did that put the incidents in a different category from other invisible phenomena that have triggered collective behavior? Now, this is interesting because they will go on to mention other things we've covered here. Windshield pitting, Rohal says, is, yeah. it may be more like crop circles in which there is a physical evidence that, quote unquote, in the quote, uh, something happened, but no one's really certain of the cause. Now, of course, we have since found evidence that in some cases, people utilize special equipment to make those crop circles. My own observation here. Yeah, not all of them, though. Yeah, uh, we did just do some. a series on that, folks. If you're yeah. new to the show, look it up. I like that one. Anyway, yeah, going, going back to the quote, the cause of the pitting is different because it would be very difficult to capture someone creating them, right? Nobody ever got caught. I don't believe, cre you know, there's copycats, certainly, and people want to take credit for stuff. But in that case, uh, a lot of this was just happening. So the article asks Rohal, is America still susceptible to a kind of mass hysteria that would lead to similar events? He goes on to say, this is interesting, the, the origin of this, quote, most people in the field no longer believe in mass hysteria as a cause of large group behavior, Rohal says. The idea came from Gustave Le Bon, Le Bon, Gustave, a French theorist trying to explain the strange behavior of large groups during the French Revolution in which average citizens began killing large numbers of people via the guillotine. What would cause them to do such a heinous thing? End quote. So Rohal says, even if this theory were true, mass hysteria, it is designed to be applied to situations of heightened emotional arousal, for example, large crowds. He goes on to say, while the ideas of pitting may have caught on among people in the region, I doubt it was an emotional contagion that drove them to act in a particular way. So the question is, uh, all right, what caused large numbers of people to report pocked windshields? He says, War of the Worlds is a wonderful example of how the media emphasizes the few real cases of hysteria without recognizing the vast majority of people knew that the radio program was fictional and they did nothing. Rohal adds, it's like crop circles. We know that some of them are man-made. So might these pits. However, the media may have had people start noticing the pits that had already been there. I like that idea. You're starting to notice, uh, notice more things, people. Stuff is there, but now you start to notice it like, oh my God, this wasn't here before, or did you just not notice it before? So he likens the experience to this, quote, it is very common for people to believe that they have contracted an illness when they hear a doctor describe a medical problem and the symptoms associated with that problem. You know people like that, don't you? I certainly do. I suspect that most people already had these pits all along and only attributed it to the mysterious cause when they heard other people doing it. Still others may have resulted from vandalism or new cases of simple accidents, debris from the roads. Is this hysteria or simply logical thinking utilizing information from the media and their own situation, a pitted car? Some research about supposed hysteria really shows that people are not hysterical at all. So I, I like that conclusion. People aren't that nuts. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. There's mobs, certainly, and that's a different thing. But when people see like a monster thing or the windshield pitting, they're not all just hysterical. I, I like it too. I think that's a great assessment uh, right. in that case. So that gets back to what I liked for our subtopic heading of this, yeah. of this episode, how I learned to stop dismissively miscategorizing potentially paranormal events as mass hysteria. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good subtopic heading. Yeah. I No, I'm down with it, man. I just, I don't know if that's going to fit on the... Yeah, I don't know if I can get it. There might be a character limit on those. That's okay. We'll try. We'll try title our thing. Our whole show is built around the fact that we never get tired of learning new things. Yeah, sure, we tend to trend strongly towards the paranormal here on <laughs> Astonishing Legends, but <laughs> the truth is we love learning about anything new. Oh, yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons we're able to keep the show fresh and our work stays interesting for us. But learning something new is about more than work in our case. It's about life. 
Taking a new knowledge helps you evolve as a person, and it keeps your mind sharp. And there's no better way to do that than with Wondrium. I just started a series that I have a feeling I'm going to wind up binging called Black Holes, oh. Tides, and Curved Space-Time, <laughs> Understanding Gravity. Wow, yeah, that is right up my alley. I, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, this course is clearly a favorite at Wondrium. It's taught by award-winning professor Benjamin Schumacher, PhD, and it has 4.7 stars from reviews on the site. Oh, yeah. You know, Dr. Schumacher is a legend in this field. He's one of the founders of quantum information theory, and he introduced the term qubit and invented quantum data compression. No small feat there. Yeah. Or as you might expect, it's called the Schumacher compression. Yeah. So tell me this, Forrest. Did you know that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is predicted to collide with the Andromeda galaxy eh? in a few billion years? And on top of that, the collision itself can take yeah. billions of years. Right. The most important force at play in all of that is gravity. Gravity is different from binding energy. For example, a rock is held together by intermolecular binding energy. Right. Yeah. Uh, learning about the difference in this stuff was pretty fascinating. It is, totally. And I have the event marked on my calendar, so don't worry. <laughs> Wondream is the subscription video service that is focused on helping you become a better you. I'm sure Scott is currently enthralled with a course on gravity, but you can explore audio and video courses on hundreds of topics taught by university professors or watch documentaries that help you learn more about the world around you. They also have video tutorials that can teach you new hobbies like photography, cooking, crafting, or one I just saw the other day when I logged in, how to play the violin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no matter what you check out, though, all of Wondrium's content is world-class and credible, presented by mm -hmm. experts who know their stuff, and it's 100% ad-free. Yeah, trust us. You know, we know you're going to love Wondrium as much as we do. So sign up now through our special URL to get your free trial. Go to wondrium.com slash legends. Don't wait. Get your learning on today. W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash legends. Forrest, have you noticed all the pictures online of abandoned malls from all over the country? Yeah, I have. It's rampant and sad. Yeah, I guess it's a sign of a bygone era, as they say, but I can't say I miss them too much. I'm, I'm much mm. happier having the things I want delivered. <laughs> That's no, why sure. I like Stitch Fix. But Stitch Fix is about way more than just having new clothes delivered to your house. Mm. It's about having those clothes curated for you by Stitch Fix. I mean, essentially, you have a personal shopper who knows not only what sizes you need, but the kinds of things you like it can actually help you develop a new look too. Yeah, I personally really love it. I've been a customer for a few years now and I love the clothes and I love the looks they've been sending me. And it feels good when I go out into the world, which thankfully we're getting back to now, at least a little. So it's great to just have new packages of hand-selected clothes coming to me to try out that I can pick the best of, and then, you know, I just return what I don't want to keep. Yeah, we've had it for a few years, too, for our son, and that's great, too. He gets good-looking stuff that matches his look, and it fits just right. Yeah, take the time and stress out of clothes shopping. Let Stitch Fix do all the work so you can spend more time doing the thing you love. It's super easy to get started with Stitch Fix, too. You just take a few minutes to set up your Stitch Fix style profile by answering a few questions about what you like to wear and, and what you don't. Yeah, and you let them know how open you are to trying new styles out. And then their experts go to work, finding things exclusively for you. Uh, Hand-picked, your size, and based on clothes you already like the look of. Yeah, they send you five pieces to try on at home. You keep what you love and send back what you don't. Shipping, returns, and exchanges are easy and free, and there's no subscription required. You can try once, or you can set up automatic deliveries, and there's no hidden fees, ever. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash AL to get $20 off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash AL to get $20 off your first purchase. This is a limited time offer. Purchase within two days of sign up. This is Nevin from the Sunshine State. When I'm not being haunted by shadow people, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. So let's get back to the show. All right, well, now it's time to talk about the David L. Miller paper. This is a really fascinating piece because they went to the area of Enfield after the Enfield monster sighting, and they wanted to study whether or not that could be attributed to the idea of mass hysteria or uh, social contagion, mm -hmm. which might be another more appropriate term for that. It, it, one of the things that they found the minute they got there was that there wasn't a whole lot of mass to any of it because mm. they only could find three <laughs> sightings, really. It wasn't right, thousands of sightings. Right. It wasn't a hundred. It wasn't even a dozen. It was just three. And it seemed like it had been a lot more because Henry McDaniel, who was the person who engaged this thing, whatever was in front of his house, 
Mm-hmm. He talked to a couple hundred newspapers. <laughs> yeah. And every time something additional happened, rather than call the police, he called a media source. So that led to this. Wait, well, it wasn't a couple of hundred, but no, I mean, it was he 200. just. He... Some of the stuff I read said there was 200 interviews that he did overall. Well, people calling him. Yeah, no, no, yeah. he did reach out. That's a fact. Yeah, no, I'm this. not saying he called right. 200 people. I'm just saying it appeared in 200 <laughs> places. So that led to the idea, yeah. and this is something that Miller talks about. It leads to the idea when you get there, you're going to find all these people that saw something. And when, in truth, the actual engagement that people had was much, much smaller. And when they got there, they found that it was yeah. three cases. The other thing that Miller talked about in uh, this paper that I'm, you know, I'm going to let you take over here with the abstract mm. from it because mm-hmm. it's interesting was that they didn't find that there would necessarily be a psychogenic reason for this because the psychogenic reason, or if you're talking about the conversion disorder, these all these mm-hmm. things, when you look at this in the big picture, the psychogenic reason might be like a made up idea of something happening. But Miller's point and his team's point was there's woods all around here. There very easily could have been some kind of animal that they saw. Right. Put that on the uh, the back burner. Don't jump ahead. I'm just giving a little short, tasty overview. You're tearing off a wing of the turkey already, and we, <laughs> we haven't even sat down to, to dinner yet. Yes, so, indeed, indeed. Pass the cranberry can. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing, though, when I was going over this, and of course, we always take a look, if we can, with the wiki article to see what if we're missing anything, really. Here, they do talk about David L. Miller's study, because it was a, a major study. This is an often study, these kinds of strange occurrences. And this is one time when you had some social scientists actually take a look at this. And I found this interesting because this is very wiki now, is that they didn't misrepresent him, but they make it out to seem like there was really nothing there that happened. And that that's what Miller and his team found out. It's all a bunch of, it's just kind of baloney got blown up, whatever. There are elements of that that are true. But what I liked about Miller's approach is that They don't consider that. They're not calling anybody drunk or hicks or, you know, mistaken. They say these things are possible, but that's not their focus of whether these people are credible or not. They just want to know how people reacted. You get a tone here with a lot of wiki things like that. Okay, it was a bunch of baloney and it's made up. So it's just kind of fun and it's pseudo this or this and that. And that, of course, is that the tone that I thought I saw when it started to discuss what they're talking about because it says... uh, in Southern Illinois, when David L. Miller and his team from Western Illinois University showed up, they were, of course, going to try and model this into a study, an examination. Does mass hysteria or social contagion work with this? Or really, is it just about collective behavior and action? When Then when you read it, it's like uh, there's a focus here on, uh, well, really it was probably just large dogs, calves, bears, deer, wildcats, you know, right. kangaroos, escaped apes. And uh, Mr. M had a notoriously overactive imagination and had been shooting at shadows. Yes. And Mr. Whenever you hear us say Mr. M in the paper, that is Henry McDaniel, which everyone yes. knows who he is from our last episode, because we're particularly, this is again, an analysis of the legend we covered in our last episode in Enfield. And right. the main character is Henry McDaniel or Mr. M. Yeah. The point here is that there's a lot more to this and this is an excerpt and yes, it's taken out of context, not terribly horrible as sometimes things taken out of context are meant to be. This is, though, the tone here is just a little more dismissive than I think Miller was about what actually people saw. That's what we want to find out. Well, what do they really see? Well, we're not going to know. It had three legs, <laughs> giant giant saucer-like flashlight eyes that were pink and glowing, and uh, who knows what that was. But what we can study is just the aftermath of how people reacted to it. And so, again, that's I guess that's my... Final thought on the the wiki entry is to put to rest, poo poo, the monster sighting. It's like, well, that's not what we're talking about here. So this is a paper, and I'm going to read the uh, abstract. This is a peer reviewed journal paper from David L. Miller and his team that we introduced earlier. This is the meat and the potatoes part of some of these concepts, and it is written for peers, for other sociologists. So it's a little dense, and you have to kind of chew on it like a tough piece of it. A lot of of meat uh, analogies here. What I'll say is that when I was reading the paper, and um, with all deference to our listeners, because there are many, many of them 
who are much better educated than I am. So I, oh, yes. they're probably not going to have the issues. But there were more than a few sentences where I was looking up probably 60% of the words in them. And because <laughs> each word represented a concept, a, right, a, a right. form of experimentation or a way of studying things. And it was a language that I was not familiar with. But now right. yeah. I am cursorarily familiar with those Very good, items. sir. And after yes. next week, you can just uh, hit the dump button on all that. Yes. Clear the cache. And we're going to finish this whole uh, episode and section with uh, boiling down what was in the textbook. And that is much more accessible and easier to read because, of course, that's meant for students. And we're not even at the level of students, but yeah. To frame that specifically, essentially, it's just so you understand what we're doing here, folks, is we're going to talk about this paper, but Miller himself writes about the paper in a textbook where he dissects it even a little bit further. And so we're picking and choosing the bits from each of those two sources that we yeah. feel like convey the message as it, in, a, in a way you can understand. Yes, of course. This came out uh, just a few years after the incident because it had to collect the data, analyze it, come up with the paper. The textbook is a few decades after, and it's uh, the one we pull from is the third edition. So it's decades later, and it, yes. the ideas are more formed, boiled down, but a lot of the critical information can be found in this paper. Quickly, I just wanted to say something else, one other thing that's here. It's a little bit of a tangent, but uh, oh not too long ago in this episode, we mentioned the neighbor kid who had encountered the creature and reported that it had shredded his shoes. Uh, we're going to be talking about that here. And Forrest said something about, oh, well, this guy should be about our age. Mm -hmm. We should try to find him. And uh, that first part of the show, we recorded uh, the day before today. We're recording the rest of it now on a suing day. And I did try to find that person. And I am sad to report that he passed away oh. at a young age of yeah. in his 20s, a fair amount yeah. of time ago. So mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to be able to make a phone call or track him down or talk to him about the incident. So no, no. His name was Greg Garrett. He he did have uh, siblings and a larger family. So maybe somebody knows somebody from that family. If you do, we're not going to yeah. try and track those folks down. But if somebody knows somebody there and they think they might want to talk to us, you know, you know where to find us. Well, on to the abstract of the paper, as, uh, as we've all come to learn, if you're not from the world of academia, is a, uh, a summary to begin with. So let me just read this, and I thought we'd maybe get a laugh. <laughs> it's, and uh, see if you can keep up with this. And if you fall asleep, mission accomplished, because so many people listen to our show for that very purpose. <laughs> but here we go. This paper makes an initial statement regarding the conceptual and empirical utility of the social contagion image as posited by Bloomer and Clapp. Their position is then criticized on the basis of its assumption that unverified and unusual sensory experiences, mobilization processes, and mass preoccupations are equivalent and undifferentiated products of social contagion. Further, the social contagion approach is unable to adequately account for differential participation in these collective behavior events. Most of these problems stem from the assumed Discontinuity between collective and institutional behavior embodied in the social contagion perspective. An alternative approach is posited which suggests that communication processes, availability of the population for participation, and institutional demands provide a more adequate explanation of differential participation with respect to unusual sensory experiences, mobilization, and mass preoccupation. A case study of a monster sighting in a rural community is presented and examined from this alternative perspective. And what does this all mean? Well, no, actually, I do understand this now, but right. I feel bad for our listeners in, in this moment. There's, yeah, no, that's why we're here. We just didn't, didn't right. post a here, you didn't read this paper and, you know, fall asleep at the wheel. We're saying uh, we're going to go through this, all of us together, and understand yes. this because we yes. talk about these kinds of events, which here are termed as unverified unusual sensory experiences, okay? So you're trying to include everything. And then mobilization processes. How do people react to this? What do they do when they come across one of these? And mass preoccupations. How does this disrupt the community once this happens and after? What was going on before, during, and after? What the goal of the paper is, is that there are old posited concepts of mass hysteria and social contagion. And Bloomer and Clapp, or we're going to mention those folks a little later, those are the sociologists that, that kind of form these ideas decades earlier. And what Miller wonders is, does that apply even anymore to what they're doing? Because the way that they 
study this and apply that term is to paint everything that happens with a flap, everything that happens with a wave and sightings and monsters and this and that and cryptids. And, and they just like, it's all kind of lumped together as mass hysteria, but that's not seemingly the case here. That's not accurate. Yeah, and that that brings me back to why my alternative title for this episode was mm. or how I learned to stop dismissively miscategorizing potentially paranormal events as mass hysteria. Right, right. That's where we're getting at now. Right. So the question this paper tries to address is, could this wave or flap of a substantial number of people in a region and time period seeing strange creatures be classified by this late 1930s term called social contagion? And that is not so much about what the monster was or if it was real, but about how people reacted to the sightings. Now, keep this in mind. I found this I, the interesting side thought for me. Like with our George Knapp and Colin Kelleher interview about their book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an idea forms, for me anyway, and I think you did too, and, and while we were talking with them, because that's what the, the book was dealing with. Yes. And that is the title of the... I know there were some comments in our own group, well, that's not a great title. I didn't hear about any skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Like, no, that, that was, it was called that, the episode, because that's the <laughs> title of their book. I, not that they were going to talk about actual inside the building in the uh, uh, A, B, C, D, whatever that is, the, the rings there, skinwalkers uh, wearing yeah, a, if it comes flannel down to shirt, that, folks, smoking lock cigarettes. yourself in your prepper cave, because <laughs> we're in deep dookie. Well, then, then the uh, conspiracy <laughs> theories of, uh, yes, uh, alien beings and uh, all kinds of reptilians are running the government. Yeah. Well, it's nothing like that, but high strangeness phenomenon may act like a viral paranormal contagion. Remember that idea? Somebody sees something on Skinwalker Ranch, next thing you know, their family at home is seeing weird stuff. Shadow people, strange creatures running through the brush, poltergeist activity in the home, and they didn't come home yet. It's like a viral contagion over time and distance of this weird activity. What does that mean? Anyway, that is really like a social paranormal contagion of sorts. Yeah. Well, continuing on with the paper, everybody talks about this classic case, and of course it was studied back in the day, the aftermath of the War of the Worlds broadcast, but also other mass things that don't go very well, <laughs> religious revivals, financial panics, mass preoccupations that have been recurring topics in collective behavior literature. And so we're going to use uh, the term here, at least the paper is, from Bloomer, from 1939, the term social contagion. This refers to a class of phenomena throughout this study here. The discussion of the paper is, one, how accurate is the social contagion image of behavior? Two, how theoretically sound are social contagion explanations of behavior? Three, what alternative foci can be employed to further our understanding of events, which traditionally have been studied from this social contagion perspective. So what is social contagion? That is a image, as you said before. The social contagion image, which is, what do you picture? How, what is this? What label is this uh, with events that happen? How do you classify things as social contagion? Well, that more specifically was the term frame analysis, which is the same mm, idea. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. I want to read this definition. Like, of frame oh, like, like a movie frame. I finally got that. Yeah. Like a, a yeah. picture frame or a movie frame. How are you framing this story? Uh, listen to this from Wikipedia. Frame analysis, also called framing analysis, is a multidisciplinary social science research method used to analyze how people understand situations and activities. Frame analysis looks at images, stereotypes, metaphors, actors, messages, and more. It examines how important these factors are and how and why they are chosen. It comes down to like, what is what is framing this particular story right. and how is that affecting how it's perceived and its effect on the people that are getting involved in it? Right, so back to the paper, this is what it has to say about that social contagion image. The social contagion image of behavior includes the assumption that under certain conditions, widespread masses of people rapidly and unanimously adopt patterns of behavior that are intense, unwitting, and non-rational. Okay, and that's from Bloomer from 1939 when, when he, he wrote that or described that. So yes, uh, big groups of people quickly, all together, adopting the same pattern of behavior that is crazy, uh, beyond their control, and doesn't make sense. Yeah, everyone's just running around bumping into each other like <laughs> Keystone Cops. And uh... Yeah, 
exactly. That's what we think of right. when you see mass panic, mass hysteria, all those terms. Not that that doesn't happen. It does. But is that what's happening during a paranormal event? So continuing on, uh, we're going to be summarizing from here on out with quotations when needed, but we're going to start with this first point. If you look at the reports that count how many people participated in events and actions that could be considered examples of what looks like social contagion, it, it's actually not that many. It ranges from less than one-third to less than 1% of the available population. That's what we're saying. These cases where you consider social contagion very small percentages right. of the population. If you look at the example of War of the Worlds broadcast and that classic 1940 study of it by a sociologist named Cantrill, again, somebody, very famous sociologists have studied this already, of course, trying to make sense of it. Their report says that most people suffered reactions of fright mostly during the first half of the broadcast, and it didn't last very long. Often, institutionalized authorities like the police or your company boss, the government, military, health officials, they're the ones that actually disrupt the daily routine of the majority of the population with their directives and that official action that can blow an event out of proportion and not really from social contagion. So think about this. You hear the War of the Worlds broadcast and a few people freak out for a small amount of time. And then people say, well, this, they listen to the other half of the show, like, oh, okay, I get it. It's Orson Welles. He's putting on a, a radio play. There's no invasion going on. But maybe somebody does something crazy at the beginning. Now the cops say, like, okay, curfew now. Nobody's coming out now for the next three nights after 9 p.m. It's like, well, I got stuff to do after 9. They're the ones who are disrupting the community and the society there because they're trying to keep the peace. It wasn't so much War of the Worlds, or, or that was a cause, but it was a very small right. blip, right? And the behavior wasn't commensurate with people freaking out. It's like the authorities are now having to put in place things to make sure nothing happens, but that's making it seem bigger than it actually is. So mass hysteria or social contagion is a lot about the perception of the event. So like in the Enfield case, when a couple people show up with guns and start shooting at creatures, then the sheriff decides he's going to arrest anyone trying to hunt monsters. Well, that right there makes it seem like a bigger deal. Wait, wait, the sheriff's arresting people? They're shooting right. monsters? What's going on? No, he's just saying like, don't do this. Don't, <laughs> don't go around with guns shooting at stuff because there might be something there, but you also might hit somebody and uh, they don't deserve that. And I don't need that in my town as sheriff. So about... Herbert Bloomer here. These theories that are referenced in the paper, I believe, are also from American sociologist Herbert Bloomer. And the paper states that Bloomer's theory of social contagion in the context of being a feature of behavior and a compelling force that lowers self-consciousness and it attracts and affects individuals. Take a pause right there because this is what you're talking about with the circular contagion effect here. What Bloomer stated early on was that a feature, this contagion, that lower self-consciousness, it attracts, it affects different people, and that in turn affects more people who are prone to that. So as the statement goes on here, it then produces a circular effect from the paper, it says, that is, social contagion is a behavioral manifestation of lowered self-consciousness, which in turn produces lowered self-consciousness. So somebody freaks out, somebody near them sees that, they start freaking out, and then everyone's freaking out. That's the circular contagious effect to it. It's just like, wait, he saw a monster? Oh my God, I think I saw a monster. Well, and to quote The Breakfast Club, I'll get up, he'll get up, we'll all get up, it'll be anarchy. <laughs> so something like that. <laughs> yeah, somebody has to start doing that, right? And then it, and then it takes off. But here's the thing, social contagion in Bloomer's theory, that requires close physical proximity and immediate sensory contact to whatever phenomenon this is, a UFO landing, a monster, a lady in white being cornered at the local subway, what, you know, whatever is, uh, is happening, you have to be real near it to get right. worked up, right. I think is what he's saying here. And then that's what creates the circular reaction here. Okay, does that fit with Enfield? So I just showed you this clip. Yes. The sky in yeah. China in a certain city Bright just red. turned red. At night. I mean, so it's a big group of people. Yeah, and uh, I don't speak Chinese, but they sound very yeah. excited and uh, perhaps worried. And then 
as we're talking here about the authorities, their job is like, oh, nothing to see here. It's just a light refracting off some fishing boat lights out in the harbor. And when the sky has a lot of moisture in it, this can happen. It's like the whole yeah. sky. <laughs> it's just, what are your uh, thoughts on that? On that particular clip that you sent? Well, we got to put a link to it now yeah. in the show notes. Yeah, it did not appear to be or an easily naturally explainable event, but it was very big. It did right. appear to be, from the perspective of the cameras, several miles across in terms of its scope yeah. and very bright, which meant that, I mean, depending on where it was, thousands, tens of thousands of people or more may have been able to witness it. And then right. when you get to the right. very stuff we're talking about here tonight, you know, the proximity of it and what, how do people react to it and what is their behavior? Of course, we'll never know because it's China, but, uh, right. And they're not exactly going to be mm. forthright about it. And they're not all super connected to the internet either. So, <laughs> or at least the internet that we yeah, can Yeah, they see. have their yeah. own thing. Yeah, they got their own thing going on. I, I would say though, that's yeah. what we're talking about here. A large group of people, thousands perhaps, it's like the Phoenix Lights, thousands of people saw yes. this thing. And so, yes, they're checking off the box of close physical proximity to the event. They're actually watching it and they are close to each other. And that's perhaps the seed bed here of a social contagion thing. Now, they're handling it pretty well. No one's burning down anything yet, but it is one of those things where you can't deny they're all seeing something strange at once, like the Phoenix Lights being much stranger. Yeah. Uh, look yeah. that case up. We're talking about tens of thousands of people in a major American city all seeing the same thing over a course of a very yes. long time, describing the same thing. Now, again, that's a bunch of people reacting individually to a major sighting, but that's not what's going no. on here. And that's not really a hysteria. Hysteria to me is inferring that nothing's really to be the cause here. People didn't really see anything. They suggested it to somebody they know. Then their imagination goes crazy and they think they see it. People saw what they saw. But it is like when one person sees a monster, then others nearby hear about it, then they see one. And, and then those people see more monsters on different occasions and it spreads like wildfire. So in Bloomer's model, it may mean that for this to spiral into a monster craze, again, people have to be very close to each other, like in a crowd, right? And they have to feel the fear themselves. And Bloomer goes on to describe things like fads, manias, crazes, things he cites as frequently involving dispersed individuals and small groups. But the authors of this paper, Miller et al., they feel that this connection between the circular reaction and, as they say, diffuse phases of collective behavior, this is pretty tenuous, kind of weak. It doesn't really make sense here. These monster sightings, as we talked about in the, the last episode, it wasn't just Enfield, yeah. right? All kinds of creatures are being seen in this, in this wave. These sightings happen in many towns over hundreds or thousands of square miles, and it may be impossible to prove what everyone saw was actually a monster. You were maybe just heard hearing about, you know, just heard of somebody talking about seeing a monster. And especially, this is the pre-internet days of 1973, right? And you would have to hear it from local TV reports or newspaper reports. It was well reported on at the time, all these sightings in their little regions. And of course, we have the wire. So you're hearing other towns are hearing about uh, other sightings in other states. So words getting around. So we're going to talk about those possibilities later. But there seems to be a bunch of collective behavior actions going on independently. We're just a few people here and there throughout the Midwest are seeing these freaky creatures, and then they're seeing their own freaky creatures. So is this connected? Or is there some kind of contagion happening with disparate groups that really aren't connected? It's just a, it's a phenomenon. So coming back to one of the two people that were the, really the, the ones that established the social contagion idea, Oren Edgar Clapp, he lived from uh, 1915 to 1997. He was a noted American sociologist, particularly in sociological thermodynamics, which, you know, it's interesting. That sounds like something that would apply mm -hmm. to aviation or something. Or, or it makes me think of schools of fish, you yeah, know, like how do they fish. all react and they all freak out? And well, go and that's exactly clouds, what right? it is. He's yeah. talking about how do ideas and attitudes and behaviors move amongst groups of people? What, how does it affect their actions and behaviors? So his uh, 1972 statement on social contagion, this is right at the start of the flap, claps flap. That's very... Uh, I made you say it. Thanks yeah. for putting that in there. 
Number one here, social contagion arises from tensions within individuals. The greater the amount of tension generated by systemic strain, the greater the likelihood that social contagion will occur. Two, mm -hmm. tensions inside individuals make them more vulnerable to suggestions. And three, the substantive features of social contagion depend on people's pre-existing sensitivities or attitude. Right. Summarizing from the paper, in the context of the infield event, there may be societal tensions prior to events like monster sightings, but evidence of tensions happening before the flap and connected to it are supposed after the sightings. So that assessment of tensions being a factor might be incorrect. You can't use post right. evidence of societal tensions to always predict something like a monster craze will happen. If that's the case, then I suspect we're going to have major monster and UFO flaps happening very soon. Maybe they already right. are happening, right. <laughs> but this is a good example of the yeah. difference between a dependent and an independent variable, which is something I had to learn about for this stuff. What? Yeah, yeah really? because the, let me, I'm going to read this. This is from ThoughtCo, which I've had to lean on a lot for this episode, but this is, uh, we'll have a link yeah. to where this is coming from, the pages is coming from. A dependent variable is the variable being tested in a scientific experiment. The dependent variable is dependent on the independent variable. As the experimenter changes the independent variable, the change in the dependent variable is observed and recorded. When you take data in an experiment, the dependent variable is the one being measured. For example, a scientist is testing the effect of light and dark on the behavior of moths by turning a light on and off. The independent variable is the amount of light and the moth's reaction is the dependent variable. A change in yeah. the independent variable, the amount of light, directly causes a change in the dependent variable, moth behavior. So here when we're talking about this, this is what's interesting. This is perfectly summing this up here because uh, what yeah. ThoughtCook goes on to say there is if you're trying to understand this, which of course I was, and I did after I saw this, but if you write out your variables as a sentence stating cause and effect, the independent variable causes a change in the dependent variable. Usually the sentence won't make sense if you get them wrong. For example, taking vitamins affects the number of birth defects. Makes sense. Birth defects affects the number of vitamins. Probably not so much. That's from the ThoughtCo website. Right. So when you look at this right. same thing, that's kind of what they're saying here. It's like, well, we can go back and say, oh, this is happening because of that. Is this a dependent and independent variable? And what they're saying uh, is these things aren't necessarily related. You can't just say that they are, and then they become related. <laughs> a lot of people will try. It's easy to point, though. That's yeah. what this concept is saying, is that, okay, so this happened... That happened during the time, but you're looking at it years later. It's like... No, and I, it's like I stubbed my toe today. It rained yesterday. Right. Is, did I stub my toe because it rained yesterday? I don't know about that, but... It, well, then, and if that's the case, if, if it's a one-to-one, -one, I mean, one doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen, but then maybe it usually should happen. So every time there's some tensions in society, right. these kind of sightings and, and riots and weird stuff happens. Maybe not necessarily. Anyway, but ab about the second of Clapp's premises, this vulnerability of people to be suggestible, that is, that once someone yeah. suggests there's a monster lurking in town, more and more people are likely to believe it, is a recurring assumption in most discussions of collective behavior. Quote, the suggestibility characterization is problematic in that people routinely comply with the directives of others as they go about their daily activity. Right. Near unanimous and continuous compliance with directives, for example, a company of soldiers executing a series of commands, occurs more frequently in carefully constructed and controlled institutional settings than in crowds. In a crowd, they're not a bunch of soldiers following orders. That's right. Like marching in, in unison, doing the, the goose step, all that kind of... They don't behave that way. So what, what we're saying here is that... We've heard this a lot. And again, we're not out to uh, bash anybody here, but a lot of... But a lot of explanations for weird stuff, we were, well, that person saw that. So, of course, they go in expecting to see ghosts, yeah. right? We see a lot for haunted houses, like, well, they'd heard it was haunted, so then they go in, and then they see a ghost. Maybe that's the case for an individual who's predisposed to this, but that doesn't really work in larger groups of people. What we're talking about when you say contagion, not one person here, groups of people, a community, towns all over the Midwest, all over the U.S., all over the world, it's not unanimous. And that's what people say, like, well, there you go. It's always, they're always suggestible. People go in and they're expected to see a monster. So then they see a monster. They were told the house was haunted. So of course they go in and they see a ghost. They're expecting this to happen. That does not really happen. Yes. 
people aren't that suggestible. And it's not, it's actually not us saying that. We're parroting it. This right. is what David L. Miller is saying. And we're sharing it with you because we agree with David L. Miller. Yeah. So that study by McPhail and Rigney yes. in 1973, they're looking at group behavior and crowds. And they say like, well, that doesn't really happen unless you are a company of soldiers. But under the conditions of social contagion, people are alleged to be temporarily quite willing to accept and act upon unverified information which is being transmitted outside institutionalized channels. That came from uh, Shibutani, another sociologist in 1966. So, okay, under certain conditions, maybe people drop their guard and they're willing to believe something outrageous. But Miller goes on to say, even in routine settings, however, the continuous and immediate verification of information, it's often impossible or at that point, impractical. So information, when it's verified, it's usually verified with respect to later events. Right. You don't know at the time. So getting back to the paper, regarding the third right. premise, consideration must be given to predispositional explanations of behavior. Participation in events constituting social contagions may involve movement to the location of the event, shouting, throwing things, standing about, or calling police. Again, that's from McPhail, <laughs> 1971. I'm going to go there and I'm stand about. stand about. Yeah. But to account for such rapid behavioral <laughs> right. variations across time in terms of hypothesized configurations of predispositions lends much more explanatory power to predispositions than is warranted. When people suddenly start acting irrationally, not how they usually do, that's what they mean by rapid behavioral variation across time, a short amount of time or a longer amount of time, when you're hypothesizing about people being predisposed to freak out and believe in monsters, it's giving predispositions to freak out a lot more power as an explanation than it deserves. Right. When you take into account how people actually behave when they freak out and go nuts, those are the terms that I understand. Yeah, it's the a most. problematic sure term these days. Can I don't think we can say right. go nuts anymore. Well, I don't think you label an individual as nuts. Right. I think you can go bananas. Should we not? Does that demean well, bananas? Why would bananas be know. okay and nuts aren't? I wonder. Okay, when people go bananas, how's that? Hey, I didn't have a problem with going nuts. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> so to sum up that idea is that yeah, people really aren't that predisposed to behave in such radical fashions very quickly in a given amount of time. And it doesn't really apply to the situation specifically of monster sightings. And then the paper goes on and it gives a bunch of statistical data on people writing. And it, it kind of concludes that section with such negligible empirical support, meaning is that we don't really see the evidence here. We have to conclude that individual predispositions are not sufficient to account for the substantive features of behavior which typically have been viewed as constituting social contagion. So what they're saying is that really, if you look at it, and a sociologist will look at it, that people's personal predisposition to go bananas doesn't really explain the behavior that's seen within groups here. So are you predisposed to believe in seeing a monster and then freaking out? Well, in summary here with this section of the paper, they say social contagion is vaguely is a vaguely defined variable employed all too casually when, quote unquote, unique events arise. What social contagion theory attempts to explain is seldom, if ever, observed. Existing theoretical statements of how social contagion comes into being are weak. That's their words. You sociologists don't get yes. that at us if you're a traditionalist. What they're saying here is that, yeah, we don't really see it. <laughs> we don't really see this kind of social contagion model, this frame, really happening and uh, certainly not and especially specifically not in the case of the infield monster which could no. represent a good portion of paranormal events of that nature which is why we're covering this and making such a big deal right. about it because we right. want everyone to remember this when we're talking about stories about cryptids that all play out in very similar ways to this one. Yeah. Again, they never address paranormal events really directly or even right. say that because that's not really the point here. It's like, we don't know what happened. People are just reacting to something. It's like, what's that red sky all about in China? I don't know. They don't know. I don't think the, maybe the government does. You'd never find out from them, as you say, but their explanations are, seem kind of weak. Yeah. <laughs> Much like flares being dropped by jets that aren't flying over Phoenix or weather balloons tied together, Chinese lanterns. Sometimes it's that. 
but we're not taking a look at what it actually is. What we're saying here is that this model, that explanation is pretty weak. Right. Let's move on from that weak sauce there, that it's a contagion and people are getting it from each other. So I think what Brian Stanley Turner, and he, he's a British and Australian sociologist born in 1945, with his suggestion that careful observation of crowds more often reveals that the condition of homogeneity and unanimity is, in fact, an illusion. Meaning, people don't all act the same. The reaction of groups of people all thinking and acting the same during a weird event flap or craze is an illusion. Yeah doesn't really yeah. happen. And I tend to believe that. Uh, people think like, oh, everybody acts the same way. It's like, well, they act in phases in the same way, but not everybody acts exactly the same way when something weird happens. And again, that leads to the weak and easy explanation of, well, that's why people see ghosts or UFOs because they want to. They go there looking for one and of course they see one. Well, not everybody. A lot of people don't go looking for that stuff and they see it anyway. Oh, and also people go wanting to see stuff and don't see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that, yeah. that is. Yeah, I go, I go hoping to see something and it just doesn't really happen all that much. Listen to this or think about this. When you think of people uh, all following in line and are ready to believe any crazy story some local crackpot tells them. Okay, remember in our Enfield episode of last, uh, of last time, if you believe the accounts... In the longer newspaper article we read, Miller and his team of sociologists found with their direct interviews, which is pretty thorough. We went over how they did that. It was probably, it was over a hundred people right. that they interviewed and just not a big right. town. So they, they covered a huge swath of, of the people that would have the best information you could say. Well, guess what? In that article though, the newspaper one, most of the townsfolk didn't believe Henry McDaniel. Yeah. The guy who was the old crackpot who, uh, you know, they say, well, you saw a kangaroo. And he's like, no, I used to have him for a pet. That wasn't right. a kangaroo. That guy, they thought he was shooting at shadows. Well, you know, when he was 12 feet away from this thing or less, eight feet, actually it was at his door. Yeah. So he was not, it uh, was not in the shadow. It was, it was looking right at him about 10 feet away. Well, even then they didn't believe him. Okay. So it's not like there's now a contagion of belief. So from that, you can assume that most people didn't believe other folks in the other towns that saw monsters. That's right. Right? That is one behavioral thing. Come on, all you out there, you don't know these people. They saw a big hairy Momo eat their egg salad sandwich. I don't, okay, I don't know what that is. I'm not sure I believe that. I don't know these people. And that's probably the case of each monster sighting. Most people aren't going to believe in it. So here's an alternative approach, though, put forth by, by Miller and his team. Behavior during these social contagions has always been characterized as being the same, homogeneous, and undifferentiated. There's no difference between these different behaviors that people do. Again, everybody during these highly strange events acts the same way, and there's no difference between the individual behaviors, right? Well, engendered in this characterization is the failure to differentiate theoretically and empirically among the following phenomena. One, unverified and unusual sensory experiences reported by a very small portion of the available population. In cases like what? The windshield pitting incident in right. Seattle. That was studied by Medallia and Larson, two sociologists in 1958. Prowlers, studied by Johnson in 1945. The Mad Gasser of Mattoon. That was a prowling yes. thing, right? As we talked about the windshield pitting, when you look at the entire population and how many cars are out there, it's a lot. It's weirdly yeah. a lot, right? But it's not that much when you consider everything. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 cars driving around. If you get 1,000 cars, mathematically, it's not that big. Number two, the mobilization processes, that means how people gather or disperse with respect to the objects established by the unverified reports Meaning, what do people do when they hear about this weird stuff? How do they get together? What do they do about it? Well, for example, citizens groups were formed to apprehend whoever was madly gassing people in Mattoon, right? We got to stop this guy. Well, I mean, it is creepy. Somebody's looking through windows of your family members. You want to put a stop yeah. to that, right? There's only so many officers the police can send out. So that was studied again by Johnson in 1945. That's a mobilization process right there. Number three mass preoccupations of the people affected in the community. 
that means the rapid and widespread dissemination of information and the belief or disbelief of that information. So that's a third thing that proponents of mass hysteria back in the old days used to say was all bundled in, didn't make any difference. They were all kind of the same thing. Those right. three things, that's very important to understand here. Yeah, and that was a hard thing for me to get when we were first assembling these notes. So I want to just restate that real quick. Number mm -hmm. one, unverified and unusual sensory experiences reported by a very small portion of the available right. population. Two, mobilization processes, which is how people come together. That's when everyone gets the, what do you call it? The pitchforks and the... Um, that <laughs> pitchforks and torches. Pitchforks and torches phase. Yeah. That people are mobilizing. Three, mass preoccupations, where everyone is obsessed with this information and, and preoccupied with it to the exclusion of their daily lives and the other things that they need to be doing. That's a, an important thing there, right. because I didn't understand that till I got to the end of a lot of this research, is that what the baseline is that these sociologists are trying to determine is daily life versus weirdness here. Right. How much does this stuff disrupt people's daily lives? When is it getting to the drop everything phase when you, you're, you know, walking out of your job in the middle of the day? <laughs> I talk about that later. To examine the yes. situation. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. I will say one time, I thought about this the other day, just speaking of strange, uh, yes, one of my favorite bands, Explosions in the Sky, but this was a scenario which was, I always remember, I was walking to, it was an evening class at USC Film School one of my favorite film professors ever, people who've been to the school know this guy, Drew Casper. A lot of fun to sit in his classes. And uh, so it was, it was just getting to be sundown. It was around Halloween. It was a whole series on horror films, right? It was a whole course on horror films. And I'll tell you, there's a magical moment which I can feel, and I, that's the reason I'm talking about this, as far as being a contagious feeling or a group feeling of something's different here. And... It's like in the movies. If this ever has happened to you, you know what I'm talking about explicitly. There's one major street there. I think it's you cross Jefferson uh, in L.A. to get across onto the campus. And I'm right at there. I just left my student apartments and uh, walked a block or so. And when you walk up to it, and it's still, there's still a lot of light in the day, but it's, uh, I don't know, maybe around 5 o'clock. It's starting to get dark. And I go to the corner there, the crosswalk, and there's a bunch of students and a few other uh, locals, and everyone's looking up in the sky. That moment right there, it's really hard to describe. It is very special. It's just yeah. like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah. Okay, when I look up, is there going to be a giant UFO or right. a some kind of sky monster? Is there right. a dragon coming? What is going on? So we looked up, and it was quite spectacular. It was just this colorful rainbow-like pattern of these brilliant colors shimmering in the sky like an iridescent kite like one of those long chinese kites that's maybe you know 30 miles long something huge in the sky just suspended and it was brilliant and that's what people were looking at and okay it's california vandenberg is close by when they do a missile launch there's ice crystals that come off the rocket because of the uh, the liquid oxygen is very cold and as that breaks up in the atmosphere and as the sun is setting it's hitting it it's creating refraction patterns and it's gorgeous but you'll see that a lot you'll see like squiggly trails of missile trails being illuminated by the setting sun or the rising sun and it's quite spectacular now the the context around that is that when it got there the film for that night that was going to be discussed night of the living dead of which the premise was and is some kind of satellite exploding, causing cosmic rays to bring the dead back to life. Yeah. <laughs> Something in this. <laughs> so right. our professor, uh, Casper, was like, oh, my gosh, did you see that? This is going to be so apropos to tonight's film. And it, that was the context. And it was kind of a it was a magical moment shared by a large group of people. But we didn't all freak out. Yeah. We looked up and we shared a moment, but it wasn't like, oh, my God, run back home, you know, right, right under the covers. Right, right. I've had a Simply Safe system for a few years now, and I love the break in protection their home security system gives me, but you know what? It's not always outside forces that you need Simply Safe's protection from. So listen to the story from a Simply Safe customer named Terry. She had left town for the weekend for her daughter's wedding. On the morning of the big day, she got a phone call from Simply Safe's 24 7 professional monitoring center. They let her know that her system had detected water in her basement. Did you know that even one inch of flooding can cause more than $25,000 in damages? 
This was a critical warning for her. Thankfully, Simply Safe detected it within moments of the leak starting. Terry just hung up with Simply Safe and called her neighbor who went over and turned her water off for her before the flooding got too bad. I had a neighbor two doors up from me. This exact thing happened, but it was yeah. a pipe upstairs in their house and it cost a couple hundred thousand dollars <laughs> worth of damage. I know that is crazy expensive and a simple fix. You just turn it off. Yeah. But this is one of the many reasons I love my Simply Safe system. I'm in an apartment and frankly, Anything could happen with my upstairs neighbor, and it has before. And if I'm out of town, I know that Simply Safe will be keeping an eye on my place 24 7 for me, not just for break ins, but fire and water damage too. Protecting against floods is just one of the reasons more than 4 million people trust their home protection to Simply Safe. With a comprehensive Simply Safe system and 24 7 professional monitoring, you can have someone always looking out for you, just like Terry. Plans cost under $1 a day with no long term contracts or hidden fees, ever. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash AL. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash AL. The economy today is a bit dicey. Inflation is way up. The Fed is raising interest rates. The housing market is possibly on the verge of a big shift, although that one may work in folks' favor. But if you've got a small business, there's never been a more important time to focus on your bottom line and find ways to stay profitable. Yeah, one of the best ways to cut costs is mailing and shipping. With Stamps.com, you can get access to exclusive discounts to mail and ship and, and great rates from both the U.S. Postal Service and UPS. It's an easy way to keep more money in your pocket. Look, if you have a small business, shipping can be a major contributor to your stress and can take up a lot of your time. Time is money, and of course money is money, and you need to save that too. So Stamps.com can help you save on all of those things. For over 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Stamps.com can give you access to all of the post office and UPS shipping services you might need right from your computer, and you'll get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 30% off USPS rates and 86% off of UPS. Wow, that's gone up since the last time we talked about it. You yeah. know, we use it whenever we're personally handling shipping on something, and it's been a game changer. Look, if you're running an Etsy shop, managing a warehouse, uh, shipping out truckloads of orders, or just mailing invoices, Stamps.com is the shipping solution for you. Even if you're selling from multiple stores, Stamps.com integrates seamlessly with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. That's right. And all you need is your regular computer and printer. No special supplies or equipment. You'll be up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send it. Start mailing and shipping with Stamps.com and keep more money in your pocket every day. Sign up with promo code ASTONISHING for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale. And there are no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code ASTONISHING. That's Stamps.com, and you click on the microphone at the top of the page, and then you enter code ASTONISHING. Hi, I'm Rascal Arson Dallahan, and you're listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now back to the show. Well, getting back to this monster sighting and, uh, and this section of the paper here, the authors go on to say, a monster sighting in Enfield, Illinois in 1973 is evidenced these phenomena, what we just talked about, the three things here, unverified and unusual sensory experiences, mobilization, and mass preoccupations. Enfield exhibited all of that. So with that, that's the basis for an alternative approach provided by these theoretical distinctions, which will be employed in discussion and analysis of this event. So that's why they decided, like, this is a very good case, that we got there, we got boots on the ground, we got immediate information directly from the people. This all points to this, that, again, why we're talking about this is a lot of people will just say like, well, that guy saw the three-legged thing and then was mass hysteria. It right. just, everybody starts seeing, the, right? The whole town's seeing monsters now. Well, of course. Like, no, not no. be further from the truth. Yeah. So before we continue on with a summary of what we've just learned, I will just have a few conclusion kind of things and then uh, stay silent while you rattle off a bunch of really interesting things and I have nothing to say about them because I <laughs> because I will have blown all my pithy insights and all that with uh, these next statements, which 
No, not really. But this is, these are my thoughts about mass hysteria, okay? Is that, so to me, before I forget, just some thoughts about what really these concepts are and what they entail. And to me, these are my understandings, but I'm sure uh, some more learned academic uh, listeners in our audience could further explain it better and more accurately. And I'm not, I'm not, and that's not a joke. If you have some insights as to how we're not getting this right, let us know. But here are my thoughts. Mass hysteria, it seems to me to be more accurately connected to psychological and physiological conditions and symptoms. Uh, that is, mass hysteria, that old out, outdated term, it affects the brain and the body and like the episode of Tourette's at the school we talked about earlier, it ultimately turns out to be more connected to something like conversion disorder. So that's what we're seeing is that people are have physical reactions to this catchable, this viral type of uh, behavior, right? And yeah. that I don't know what started it. That's maybe fascinating, but it's so out of the ordinary, especially for school kids that they start adopting it. But that's physical. That's happening in the brain. It's not like you have a lesion in the brain, as we explained earlier. You're reacting. There's really nothing physically wrong with you. It's just how your brain is processing this, right? Now, social contagion, on the other hand, along with collective behavior and collective action to me, that's more a product of social and societal effects and not so much about biology. It has more to do with how groups of people react to something quite unusual that's been seen by one person or many people. So I would say that the few people who saw the Enfield monster or the Muddy monster or Momo or Bigfoot or the Phoenix Lights or the aerial school group UFO encounter and uh, even most uh, all of the War of the Worlds audience didn't all go either nuts or bananas. Uh, <laughs> even most of the people freaking out with the, with the War of the Worlds audience that was a very small group, but that's quite some news. So you pay attention to that. And of course, that's what the media runs with, no matter what the time period is. They don't want to report like a bunch of people saw this movie or listened to this program and nothing happened. Right. That's not news. Well, <laughs> so, but you know, here's another angle on this. Some very close encounter experiencers or abductees have reported many a physical symptom but their symptoms didn't spread to a mass of people. Even if you think that other experiencers may have been influenced to fabricate or believe in physical symptoms they heard about from other abductees, it's still not mass. Right. It's still not a wave. It's, it's very rare. And if you really do look at the data and don't just shove it all into the same uh, desk drawer, they are quite different. That's what people do. It's like, oh, everybody gets probed. I don't worry about the probing. Well, no, that's really, <laughs> I, I think Rob would say that, that the first time most people heard about that was with the Whitley Strieber incident, but it's not a common feature. That's, of course, what people focus on because it's it's so horrible. Right. <laughs> like, right. oh my God, that's terrible, but what a weird thing to make up. But of course, it, there you go. That's the jump the shark moment in the abductee experience. Anyway, well, why don't you start by wrapping this whole show up here with a summary of the concepts. Now, I will just preface this. These concepts have been reproduced and repackaged for this textbook decades later, titled Introduction to Collective Behavior and Collective Action, the third edition. And that's from Miller's textbook. And it's a lot more readable. But I did like the paper because, it again, that's a lot more in-depth. So you, you get a lot more detail. Like, well, I know it's not very accessible to a lot of folks, but if you can get your hands on it, that's a great timeline of everything that happened because they hunted down a lot of newspapers, a lot of news reports at the time, talked to a lot of people, and it's a good tracking of how that story broke over multiple news outlets and sources and newspapers and the Times. And you can see how this kind of spreads just the information about it. And that's fascinating in itself. It's a great timeline of this event, which you don't often get because you never really get a team of sociologists going to study this weird stuff. And Miller would be the first one to tell you that. Yeah, it's most people don't bother with this stuff. But Enfield and others like it fits everything they're talking about. All right, so using the incident at Enfield, again, as a template, here is a summary analysis of collective action as it applies to encounters of high strangeness and the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Although, mm -hmm. of course, those things aren't mentioned in the textbook or the paper. No, they, 
<laughs> there may have been the word strange, but uh, not high strangeness, not in the Jacques Vallée meaning. And certainly I never saw the word paranormal pop up. But you know, you know what? I didn't see all of the textbook. The next chapter, as we mentioned earlier, talks about the Warminster thing and yes, how that affected right. uh, the whole town of yeah. Warminster. Yeah. yeah. Well, according to Miller's research, there are three areas or phases of the collective action and behavior that happens after a strange incident. As we said, unusual mm -hmm. and unverified experiences are number one. Two, a mobilization phase. Three, general preoccupation. Or as I would interpret of the people affected or within the sphere of influence of the event. So in this case, the townsfolk and in, infield. Yeah, exactly. Yes. What, what were they doing before, during, and after this happened? Right. Now, I think another valid criticism that Miller makes of the social contagion image or model for cases like monster sightings is that proponents will lump these three things together and don't make much of a distinction between them when they appear as three separate and distinct phases to sociologists like Miller. Right. So looking first at number one, again, unusual and unverified experiences. As Professor Miller and his team interviewed the residents connected to the infield incident, they, quote, saw no compelling reason to attribute the monster sightings to psychogenic causes. End quote. Partly because newspaper and radio reports led them to believe the actual number of monster sightings was much larger than the handful they turned out to be. Mm -hmm. Henry McDaniels reported to the newspapers that others in his community had seen monsters, and this created the impression that a large number of sightings had occurred. The White County Sheriff, and that's the name of the county, not the color of the skin of the sheriff. Oh, it's no, no. Just yeah. so everybody knows. <laughs> the white, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah, the White County Sheriff told them that news reports of the guys he arrested were supposedly on a, quote, monster hunting expedition was an exaggeration. Right, the, right. the sheriff said those guys were mostly just out drinking and raising hell and only <laughs> briefly mentioned the monster during questioning. Right, right. The sociologist found perhaps no more than three firsthand monster reports and that only three hardly constituted an epidemic of monster sightings. Yeah. Maybe if you're one of the three. Yeah, yeah. if you're one of the three. There's two others like, like me that uh, that saw this. Yeah. You want some company. That's a good song by James. Dunham. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, quoting from the textbook chapter, quote, such findings are consistent with those of the mass hysteria studies discussed earlier in this chapter. That is, in episodes of this kind, the number of unusual and unverified experiences is smaller than initially thought and represents only a small portion of the available population, end quote. Mm -hmm. Miller and his team also don't believe the monster sightings were attributable to psychogenic causes because Enfield at the time was surrounded by fairly rugged woodlands. So to them and the residents they interviewed, what was seen could have very well been something more natural, like a bear which is what McDaniel initially thought was causing a ruckus and scratching outside his door. Or a deer, a wildcat, mm -hmm. uh, something more mundane and indigenous. Finally, right. some interviewees suggested that Mr. McDaniel had a notoriously active imagination. And only one other person they interviewed agreed with Henry McDaniel that he had indeed seen a, quote, monster from out of space. Mm. Well, that's at least one other person. Yeah. They don't say who said that, but... I wonder about that. Because like you and me, I hope you're with me on this, like to keep open the possibility of weird things really being out there. And yeah, I, absolutely. And also there's a suggestion too that sometimes people see things and they don't report them or they don't yeah, care yeah. to report them. And it right. might have just been a fluke that that person even went on the record. And yeah, exactly. that doesn't right, mean right. that, especially if they're unnamed and, there's, and the trail went cold on that to... Uh, there's a podcast I like, by the way, by Robin Warder. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you get a cut of that? You, uh, no, I'm not it. actually, but uh, I will I will throw it out there. It's a good show. Okay. But the question is, yeah, what was in it for that person to anonymously say, no, I saw something and, and that's as far as it goes. It's a dead end informationally. Yeah. That yeah. makes it more believable to me, frankly. Right. I mean, if you know the person. You're not looking look, for any attention. You're not looking. You're just yeah. saying like, look, I, you know, I saw something weird. I saw something weird. It should be documented. And uh, we've talked about this is that a lot of the, especially with Bigfoot sightings, the authorities, the fire department, park rangers, it's an online reporting system. And the pull down menu does not have Bigfoot on it. It's right. got walking bear upright. Right, so right. it only goes so far. So there's a lot of gaps here in the data. And what you're talking about is that maybe there were seven or eight other people who saw something exactly like what McDaniel saw, but they never came forward or they're not going to tell some out of town sociologists who 
are going to put a, a, a funny jacket with uh, no sleeve holes in them. Right. And that's it. And people are genuinely afraid of that. Yeah. Or in the case of uh, 10-year-old Greg Garrett and his family, they right. later came out on the record and said, oh, no, we were just making fun of Mr. McDaniel. And Yeah. And that might totally be the case. We're not, yeah, we're not trying to poke might holes be, in that. Right, but it may, right. it might also be that they saw something and then when they saw the attention McDaniel was getting, they were like, oh, I don't want to be part of this anymore. How yeah. can we put a stop to this? <laughs> Let's just sure. say it was a joke. Say it was a joke. So right. you don't really know. Even if you don't know or know or how many people saw this, the point here is that this is not a, a mass wave of hysterical townsfolk, right. okay? Right. That's what we're talking about. Well, what do people do? So our second point here is mobilization. Now, people either tend to move toward or away from scenes of unusual and unverified events. I like that's a... Uh, we got to start a band with that name, Unusual and Unverified Events. Or that'd be the name, actually, I'm sorry, that'd be the name of my event company. Uh, yeah, I like it. And I'll, I'll just add right here that moving toward or away things has been redefined for me by everything we've covered. There's a lot of yeah. things now that I'm definitely going to move away from <laughs> that I might have, in the past, I might have wanted to get closer and see what it was. But now right. I'm just going to, I'm going to, it's like after we heard about the balls of light passing through people and causing lifeline Ooh, problems and yeah, cancer. Yeah, it's yeah. like, that's oh, okay. I don't need to see that up close. Good point. You, you bring that up and I'm not even going to say the name, but let's say that I know you, you very well, my dear friend, is that you're one of the least predisposed persons I know to believe in, in crazy stuff. Okay. Yeah. Especially a few years ago. And so when you enter a place that's like, Ooh, it's got this reputation. I didn't even know what that reputation really was. I, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't want to know. Like you, I'd like to sometimes go into a movie not knowing anything about something. So uh, you go in there and then something happens and it's like, well, it kind of happened to you, didn't happen to me. Neither of us, I think, were really predisposed because otherwise I went in there looking for something. I should have been the one to see Wait, something. what location are you talking about? No, I'm not going to say it. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I want people to, uh, to take location? a shot when we're done, because that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Okay. Ooh, this is, yeah, I know, this is a, it's a lot of heady stuff, but I, I, I found this fascinating. And, and again, that's why we covered it, because it, it's so apropos. But with that predisposition, we go in there looking for something, and then you see it, of course, nah, it's weak. Yeah. Weak sauce. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But people do get up and move, man, when something like this happens. So what do they do? They either tend to go towards something like, hey, that's pretty cool. We should go check that out. Or this thing's coming to get us. Let's get out of here. When it's something, though, like Prowlers, like the Mad Gasser of Matoon, Matoon, yeah, see, I'm already, I'm just going to say it in every variation, and then yeah. uh, you can pick the one you like. They form neighborhood patrols to go find this creep because this has got to stop. It's weird. I mean, nobody's dying, but it's it's very unsavory. So <laughs> people mobilize, and the movements of people that are it's either hostile towards the event, like they're going to go stop it, stab it with pitchforks, burn it, or they want to celebrate it. Okay, think about this. Think about the family parked by the side of the road eating KFC in Close Encounters. One of my favorite scenes, because <laughs> it always makes me want to eat KFC. Yes, of course. And they're, they're playing cards and having a good time. It's just like, <laughs> I would love to be doing that, drinking Kool-Aid, side of the road. It's, it's an event. So they're going to it. They'd heard there's activity on that road. They're seeking it out. Or you talk about the scene on top of the U.S. Bank Tower in Independence Day with foolish people holding up signs. You know, let's commune and we want to be friends. Those are people going towards it. The villagers who want to kill Frankenstein's monster are going towards the castle. They're moving one way or the other. So these gatherings or dispersals of people are termed, I believe in sociological circles, as assembling processes and are a differentiated phenomenon. Just how people move. What do they, what do you do? Do you stay at home, do nothing? Right. Or do you get out? Or do you run away and hide in your basement? So a necessary condition for an assembling process is that these people need to be notified of an event occurring at some distant location. So you have to hear about it, right? And helping this assembling process is that a large number of people are in general proximity to one another and that they have to have the times free to get together. This is what I'm talking about, the practicality of paranormal events, okay? So when they do go check out something, it's usually got to be after work hours, weekends, or holidays, which is so prosaic, it's it's hilarious. <laughs> it's, people get stuff to do, okay? It's like, hey, you want to go check out this monster? It's four in the morning, dude. Just, no, I got to get up <laughs> at three hours. You know, I call you like, Scott, let's go. To the, I, I got to get up with the kid. I got to make him breakfast. 
and it's like, oh, I'm sorry. So me, the single guy, will go out chasing the monster. You have a <laughs> life. So like all these other people, it's like they're not going to go do crazy mobilizations if it's <laughs> at times when they have responsibilities, especially if it's just something they've heard about. So in this case, helping this assembling process is one, that people are in a close proximity together, like a community, a neighborhood, and then they have time to do this, okay? So as with the first Enfield sighting reported by Henry McDaniel, the neighbors said uh, when they were interviewed that about 50 to 75 neighbors showed up at his house to see what was going on along with the state police. So I think when police at showed up- At the time, up, by the way, that would have been yeah. a tenth of the population. Well, yeah. There, come on. It's, it it's about probably a little quiet. It's a little quiet in the town. And yeah. this is a big deal. Like, what's going on over there? Okay, keep that in mind. That's another aspect of this assembling process here. So- not many people showed up to the second reporting, okay? So when McDaniel had a second sighting, no assembling processes took place. No one really showed up for that. And there's a reason, Miller will say. So there's two different reactions of assembling and then not assembling for the two different McDaniel sightings. But both of those could be interpreted as effects of hysteria, as discussed, I think, by... They make a reference to a surname here in the textbook... I think it's American sociologist Neil Smelzer, S-M-E-L-S-E-R. And that point is that in cases like this, people can get emotionally burned out or oversaturated by an exciting event like this, and that they can become almost immune to any subsequent events. People get their fill of excitement, actually, and then they stop paying attention with cases sometimes argued as falling under hysteria. So to be clear... I think Neil Smelzer here is saying that uh, when it's a hysterical event, when there's mass hysteria and something exciting goes on, if it keeps on going on, people eventually get, they get tired of it. They don't have the energy to get excited anymore. And then the things that happen after, there's another monster. It's like, ah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just can eat dinner. I don't, yeah. And then they don't even pay attention anymore. But that's when things were whipped into a frenzy. It takes a lot of energy out of you. So that's sometimes often attributed to the, uh, let's say, mass hysteria or social contagion, uh, what do you say, image or frame, right? But Miller, however, and his team credit the two different responses to McDaniel sightings because of what's called, or they call this, cues to conduct. What signals are you receiving to tell you what to do or how to behave? Cues to conduct. So the second sighting, get this, what really happened was that that happened around 3 a.m. There was no gunshots heard, no police showed up. So it's likely that no Enfield residents were even made aware of the second sighting until they read about it in the Carmi Times. That was just a special to <laughs> McDaniel. He's the yeah. only one who saw that. Yeah. So in that case, there are less sensory cues that something exciting is happening. And the further away people are from it, the less that they're going to know about it. And if you can't see or hear the event to be a witness of it, then you depend on face-to-face -face communications phone calls, mass media announcements, and in this day and age, internet and social media notifications that tell you uh, about the event and whether you should be going to it or running away from it. Right. Depending on your taste. So we're, we're bombarded. But this is an important factor. A lot of this is information. Well, that's what we're doing here now. We're telling you about it. It's the dissemination of information because guess what? This doesn't happen to a bunch of folks all the time every day. It's a very special events, and if you don't hear about it, there's a good reason, and you're probably not going to react to it, obviously. So another factor that's important to this notification process are the, the circumstances of the reporting. So in the case of Enfield, for the second sighting, it was McDaniel, if you remember, who called the Kokomo, Indiana radio station to report it. K-O, K-O, I think, Coco. And he didn't call the police this time, but he he's wanting to spread the word. He believes in this. Like, people should know about this. I don't care what I look like. Something else happened. Also, at this time, what else is going on? News and media producers, I think as we said in the, the past episode, they may have wanted to push this Enfield story as a welcome break and mood lifter from all the heavier stories and circumstances at the time. The news cycle that time was long and depressing, with flooding delaying the spring planting in southern Illinois. That was a huge problem then. The bad news that was coming about the Vietnam War on the TV and in the papers all the time. And then now you got the Watergate scandal news breaking. So people get exhausted with that. 
And uh, that still goes on today. So once people started hearing about the events in Enfield, that's when people in the region, like news reporters, uh, oh, I love this too. This, that's definitely uh, would have been a Carl Kolshak case here, the yes. Night Stalker. Uh, <laughs> he would have been obsessed with this, this crazy monster. Guess what? Because he was based in Chicago. He could, I'll drive down, to, I'll drive down tonight. And then he <laughs> interviews Enfield. But what would have happened is he would have gotten attacked he would have gotten pictures, and then the pictures get destroyed. That's right. usually the, the MO. Yeah. In any case, when something like that happens and the news gets out, that's when people start flooding in. Uh, news media, anthropologists, sociologists, a couple of paranormal researchers at least, uh, Lauren and... Yes, uh, Lauren Coleman. And? Richard Crow. That's right. So at least, at least two bona fide knowledgeable guys came to town when they heard about it. And again, he's based out of Chicago. It's just a, uh, it's a long drive down, but he, but they make it. And then you get some legend trippers, right? They all converge on Enfield, but guess what? Mostly on the weekends, when <laughs> it was more convenient for them. So this mobilization happens, but not in a frenzied way. That's what we're getting at here. The mobilization processes or assembling processes are given consideration as they are considered a part of the hysteria phenomenon. People get hysterical quote unquote, then they run towards or away from something. But Miller and his team offer a different theory than a connection to hysteria, right? That these mobilization or assembling processes are a result of processes of notifications through which people learn of the location of an event. What happens now? Some TikTok or YouTube influencer says they're going to be at this location and then it's mobbed with young folks. Right. We're talking thousands of them, and it creates a scene. That's a process of notification, right? So in this case, though, they didn't all show up in the same place because it's the last place a monster was seen, and they want to kill it or capture it, or they want a safe place away from the monster. That's what happens during this notification process. Also a factor in non-hysteria mobilization is what Miller calls differential availability, meaning people mobilized or they assembled when they had time for it and their life responsibilities weren't pressing. They scheduled a time to visit. So you can think of it as hysterical people not dropping everything and running out of their office buildings and run out of the house and drive away like Spielberg's War of the Worlds. But that's when you panic and you run away from it. That's not what's happening here. Or as in the, the Jacques Vallée character, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, they were invited. They were drawn to the event. So this leads to the third phase, general preoccupation. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so although rapid and widespread dissemination of all types of information is a necessary part of contemporary social life, I'm pretty sure that Miller may not have imagined how much info we're bombarded <laughs> with every moment uh, than it was back in his day. Yeah. yeah. So a statement like a, quote, a state police car just parked in front of Harry's house, end quote, might get people to walk outside in their robes and see what's going on. People have to at least get the idea and statement, let's go see what's happening before right. people are given the idea to check it out. It's a prescription for action. Yeah, he's big on the word prescription. So basically, like, you just heard about something and then you get an idea told you to go do something about it. Right, exactly. Now, if there's an account of an unusual and unverified event in your neighborhood, one is more likely to go check it out or tell others to come with them to check it out. Again, a prescription for action. Like one of the kids says in E.T. about mm. the noise in the shed. You stay here, Mom. We'll <laughs> check it out. Yeah, right. And uh, you're more likely to go check something out if it's in the evenings, after dinner, or on the weekends. <laughs> if you don't have to take time off from work. It's also more right. likely that these reports of strange events and the resulting calls to action happen within groups of people who normally interact with each other in the community right. and participate in activities together. Yeah, you already know them or, yeah. or know of them. Right. One of the aims of Miller's research and subsequent report was to try and figure out how monster sightings and other unusual events prompted activity in the town that was outside of ordinary daily routines. Yeah. They found that the infield residents were very well informed of recent monster activity and were casually discussing it in their homes, cafes, and the usual meeting places. And even the school kids have recited a few <laughs> poems to the sociologists 
that they had written about the monster. Right, and, right. And we talked about this in the episode. We talked about the interview that took place at the hotel that I now have a postcard from. Oh, and yeah. we also talked about the apparently not very nice poems that we can't get a hold of that were written about <laughs> Mr. Uh, McDaniel. Oh, dear. But yeah. this is funny and ironic, but Miller states that the only discussions about the monster that disrupted daily infield life were their interviews, the ones yeah. that his team conducted. <laughs> they were the most disrupting thing about this yeah. whole event. Right. The only other disruption of monster talk was to small children who were frightened of small noises going out at night and having bad dreams. Yeah. Someone, as a joke, put up a sign near the tracks where McDaniel said the monster was ambling with a, quote, danger monster crossing sign. <laughs> I wish I had that sign. Yeah, that would be awesome. Another interesting note from Miller is that of all the respondents to their interviews, the person who was most vehement in his denial that a monster was sighted was the White County Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it was his activities as a peace officer that were the most disrupted than any other person they interviewed. All the calls from reporters, arrests of the hunters, complaints from county residents had really hindered the regular duties for him and his staff. It's the pre-established or institutionalized relationships within a community that are key factors in determining how routine activities are disrupted rather than who believes information and who doesn't. And the other thing I remember from one of the articles was the sheriff was concerned that some local kids were going to get shot by somebody. There's one woman that they interviewed and, uh, you know, they asked her, how's this disrupted your life? And she said, well, I told my kid not to go around the McDaniel property because some darn fool is going to shoot him. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, again, that's not fear. It's not hysteria. It's just like, that's practicality. Like, yeah, well, those guys are driving around and, you yeah, know, who's who are out town. Just, shooting yeah, just stay hunters. away from that place. One important factor here is when you talk about institutionalized relationships, uh, pre-established, like you're talking about the police, teachers authority figures, people that have important jobs, those folks, when they get disrupted, life is disrupted for everyone else. Right. It, what if uh, there's a there's a sick out with the police department and now no one's answering calls? Right. The fire department's down or whatever. The engine, you know, the fire engine in town, the one of the volunteers uh, doesn't work. You got a problem. Those things have to keep running. And that's more important about those disruptions than whether people believe or don't believe in a monster. So the major point of David L. Miller and his right. team in analyzing the infield case was to point out how the collective action approach is more effective for understanding unusual events that in the past have been considered to be mass hysteria. You get the point, right? Is that he's saying like, we got to maybe park that idea. Yeah. Especially when it comes to these events. Right. So in regard to those three phases of social contagion, mass hysteria or collective action we stated earlier... They found that only three instances of unusual and unverified events or monster sightings occurred. With respect to mobilization, neighbors said that about 50 to 75 people first gathered right. at the McDaniel's house at the first sighting and after state troopers arrived. Less than 10 people actually mobilized right. to hunt the monster. With regards to general preoccupation, virtually everyone in the community discussed the event with each other. Their data showed that the type and extent of participation in the event varied considerably. And, quote, in mass hysteria studies, researchers usually fail to make such distinctions and consider these diverse types of participation as equivalent to one another. They would view all types as symptoms of mass hysteria, end quote. That's another huge point here, is that they just said, well, this all happens together. There's no real need to define or divide up these types of behaviors. It's just all part of mass hysteria. Whereas Miller's saying like, no, no, there's distinct phases that happen and it determines what kind of event it is or, or how to view the event. It is important. And so Miller and his team didn't interpret these events as evidence that everyone took leave of their senses or abandoned the ways that they would normally act when dealing with more normal problems. The way people found out about the monster sightings was similar to the way they find out about other community happenings like yeah. street accidents, civil disorders, sports rallies, and public meetings. Any mobilization didn't disrupt the community routines as they took place when people had time and the discussion didn't disrupt anything. Right. The spread of monster information and the question of whether it was believed would have been a primary focus of a mass hysteria study. Yes. That's what they're more interested in is like, well, what do people believe? And they're, they're saying it, it doesn't really matter because most people don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not a factor of like so many people believe this. They went rioting. Or the whole town went to, 
Frankenstein's castle. Yeah, and the other thing about the hunters, the five hunters, they were not monster hunting. They were five hunter guys who were having a bunch of beer. Four of them were unemployed, and the other one was on military leave. That's it right. Was, you know, th- it wasn't hard for them to show up. No, exactly. That's why they, they had time to do it. They were just kind of having fun. It's just young guys out, uh, when the one guy's on leave, and so that's what happens. You know, we're huge fans of Lauren and Richard Crow. Yeah. And uh, they know what they're doing. And that's the other part of this. It's a, it's not a dismissal of any of this. It's that they claim that they heard something that was like an inhuman noise, biological. And that's a different thing. And they are part of this equation, but not the part that we're analyzing here or the part that matters really in looking at this as a group action. How do people behave as a town? Well, the summary of the chapter from the textbook reads as this, and then we're, I want to go back and read a little something because, I, again, I, I love the attitude of uh, these researchers, and this that'll come back to the academic paper. But here's the summary that's in this chapter for all of Enfield and mass hysteria. Mass hysteria was the first theoretical perspective within the field of collective behavior. It fostered an early interest in unanticipated, unusual, and, to some observers, senseless and possibly dangerous episodes of collective emotional displays. A few mass hysteria studies represent the first attempts to quantitatively examine collective behavior. The collection actor perspective, on the other hand, has focused on social movements, the dynamics of protest and behavior within gatherings to the exclusion of many of the traditional topics within the field of collective behavior. This is particularly the case in regard to studying those unusual events that were first studied from the standpoint of mass hysteria perspective. In the concluding section of this chapter, it is shown that the resource mobilization, political process, frame analysis, and perception control perspectives can be used in the analysis of such events. So they're making the argument here, and I'm buying it, that this is a good way to look at events like this. It works. It all fits. The definitions fit. It's more accurate. Here's the statement that I like that is made by uh, David Miller and uh, the other authors of the paper here. We acknowledge that people's behavior with respect to strange millennial movements and reports of monsters, flying saucers, and flying saucer abductions traditionally have been assigned to the, quote, back wards, end quote, of sociological investigation. When discussed, these events usually are casually attributed to the workings of social contagion. In contrast, we suggest that events of this order occur quite frequently in all parts of the United States and are constituted by processes common to other more familiar social phenomena. The analysis of these processes can be considered as legitimate sociological problems. Whether they are transpiring in such diverse contexts as formalized work settings or during monster sighting episodes. They end the paper with a great review by somebody reading it uh, who had a great comment because I I agree with it. So what I just read there was basically like, this is worth looking at. This is been poo-pooed before, dismissed as mass hysteria or just social contagion, and then that's just a weird thing that people do. But it's worth studying. And this behavior, now the monster sightings are rare, of course. This behavior, though, can be applied to a lot of different scenarios, one of which you and I were just talking uh, that uh, that happened in the news uh, a little while ago, let's say, when things get out of hand. A lot of these formats and frames and ways of looking at it can be applied with this model here. But our realm is the paranormal and fun, spooky, crazy, weird history stuff. And that's how we look at these things. So, but I like this end statement here. And this comes again at the end of the academic journal paper written in uh, 76, a few years after Enfield. We concur with one of our reviewers who notes, to be wrong about collective behavior is to be wrong about society as a whole. The study of such seemingly strange events as monster sightings is important, I think, precisely because such phenomena must cause us to examine more closely our assumptions about ordinary, everyday life. It's worth taking a look at. I agree. Yeah. 
Well, in conclusion, one of the things that I've learned from this, like we said, it was very nice to see this intense evaluation of how people reacted in this scenario, because it helps us understand these legends when we start to look at them going forth in the future, because the infield monster is a classic case of something that comes up for us over and Mm -hmm. over again. The circumstances are different, but it's now, now we get this extra toolbox where we get to understand a little bit more about the sociology of the people reacting to it. And I point to the Jersey Devil a lot because we talked a little bit about that and the research we did there and how you could go back to connect it to a political feud, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. which was Family great. Feud. And it, to take all of that and then tie it together with, with this information really helps you get even further. But it doesn't change the fact that somebody probably saw something. Now, whether they misinterpreted yes. it whether it was a dog with mange, like they say about Chupacabra, or whether it was some other malformed but decidedly terrestrial Mm -hmm. creature, or if you're going to believe Henry McDaniel, who is a World War II veteran, a man who owned a kangaroo and knows what a kangaroo looks like, at least that's what he said. (laughs) And what the footprints look like. And, and, And just a quick side note here, what Miller and his team were saying were they, they couldn't find mass psychogenic illness or psychogenic effects in this is that people weren't reporting seeing a giant pink elephant out in the middle of the desert. Right. No, they reported some kind of animal in a wooded area. So it's very likely that they could have seen something. That's right. They could have seen something real. The question is, what was it? How does it connect to other sightings in the area, to a larger flap, to a wave? Is there still a seed there? Because the idea of the initial sighting of the cryptid in this case, and in all cases of cryptids, is separate from the idea or the analysis of what the people did after it was gone. And that's an important thing to remember to keep divorced, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times you're just talking about one sighting. And maybe you'll be talking about multiple sightings, like in the case of the Mothman. That's something way more uh, developed. But when something happens over the course of one night or just a couple of nights and only a handful of people are involved in it, All that matters is what that initial experience was for those initial eyewitnesses. Yeah. Whatever happens later has no bearing, really, on the reality of the initial event. And you have to remember that those things are separated. That comes back to the statement that we often make, like, the ghost doesn't really care if you believe in it. If (laughs) if it was there, it was there. And if it wasn't, it wasn't. And no matter how many discussions you have about it later and Mm -hmm. what the approach is with them, whether it's an antiquated mass hysteria approach or or a more current one, like the one we're talking about here with right. Mr. Miller, all of those analyses are not connected to the original event. The event is the event. Yeah. But on the other hand, one thing that I do like about all of this is the idea that Miller is saying mass hysteria, the, the implication between the lines is, is it's a little bit lazy and you have to get more granular when you're looking at how the people reacted in these scenarios and to get a better picture of the reality of the situation and what happened later. It's just not scientifically accurate right. that that much under those terms. Under those terms, this is not the most accurate thing we could apply to this scenario. That's right. And it's also dismissive in a lot of ways, yeah. which is like you drew a comparison to our show on the Kelly Hopkinsville incident and our talk about the paper there that we that we were talking about. And there is a comparison there, and that mass hysteria is much more evolved than the ideas that were presented in that paper about Kelly Hopkinsville. But still, it's not going far enough. It's not taking the situation seriously. And maybe they weren't taking it seriously in this case because, oh, it's a monster. It's this weird thing that we don't really believe in anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's just categorize it as this system of analysis that actually probably is too broad. But you know what? It's done. No one's going to look at this anymore What the three-legged thing that the guy shot at and ran off over the train tracks. And so it's no, you're going to, if you're going to do an analysis, make the effort to do it the right way. Mm-hmm. The idea that multiple witnesses see something, if something is real and it's gallivanting yeah. around and it can't find <laughs> its spaceship or its ship is broken or yeah. it's whatever, or it's some kind of malformed But what I'm trying to say is if it's real, more people are going to see it. Yeah. 
then you get into it's it's like Bigfoot or the idea of Bigfoot, who maybe has been miscategorized as all these other things all over the country, and the nomenclature's right. wrong, but it's all one phenomena. The bit of this that's interesting to me is like you say, well, let's say McDaniel saw something and it was real, and then ten or fifteen pe- other people saw it. Then are you going to come in and apply either one of these theories, the mass hysteria yeah. theory or Miller's more current theory? to it and try even harder to discredit it because so many people are reacting to it. And now we're going to categorize this as human behavior when in reality there was something there and all those people did see it and you're just trying to explain (laughs) it away at this point. Yeah. It's the explaining away part. That's what I like. Miller's not really doing so much. And again, it's like I said, going circling back to the second half of this episode here is that when you, that's the feeling I got. And of course, that's the feeling I usually get when I read the wiki article uh, entry on uh, anything weird like this. They're trying to use this to, if not dispel it or outright debunk it, it's just kind of like tamp it down, put a little water, throw a little cold water on it, you know, or it's pseudoscience. And I understand you have to, they have to do that. I understand they have to do that. You just can't come out full blown until really something happens. And then it's, that's admitted and well known. That's outrageous. And then you have to change your tune and everyone that, and everyone has to. And what you see in the wiki article is that it's a way to kind of dismiss it a little bit, but that's why I like Miller's article here and the researchers. He's not doing that because it's not important. Really. It's not relevant. They're there to study people, not three-legged monsters. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> not, that's not, what you want to find out about. That's not what sociology is about. That's what cryptozoology is about. Maybe even anthropology. If if it's uh, you catch something and you want to know how does this fit in the, the chain of evolution or whatever, <laughs> where's this thing from? What you're looking at here is what should be important. And it's not that paranormal baby thrown out with the bathwater. He's saying this is important because these things do happen. And how do people react to this. It's how they react. That's what we're here about. And that's what we want to know. So it's taken seriously and it's taken some new ideas that are latter 20th century and applying them and updating our thinking, which is what science should always be doing, updating itself. What doesn't fit anymore? What are the accepted things that could change possibly and need updating? So to your point, that's what I like about this is it's not trying to debunk anything. It's let's see what actually happened because that we can examine. And it really happened to real people. Some people really saw something. And that's a statement that I like that I think Miller actually said something. It's not unreasonable that they did see something. That's why they don't think people are making stuff up totally out of whole cloth or that nobody saw anything. You're all mistaken. It's very likely some creature was seen. Well, How did that blow out of proportion? This is going to keep happening, and I hope it keeps getting studied. But one thing that I feel good about, that we actually get a lot of comments from people with their own stories, and they just want to know, I'm not bananas, right? And we say, no, you're not. You're not alone. These things happen. So when it comes to a group of people seeing something, or a community, or a village, or just three or four people, or an individual... I am now confident and armed with the knowledge, scientifically, as a social science, that no matter what people say about you and your experience, you're not all hysterical. That's going to wrap up our show on what it wasn't or how I learned to stop dismissively miscategorizing potentially paranormal events as mass hysteria. Visit patreon.com slash astonishing legends to access our exclusive junk drawer show that runs every week. The main show is dark, which means patrons can hear astonishing legends year round. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. E N F I E L D. This is Mrs. Nobody. Hi, I'm Rascal Arson Dollahan. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. 
Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>